camping without ads and get access to our older episodes, all of the older episodes that are so classic. Well, there's, I'm sorry, there's just no way to do that. Uh, except by signing up for Stitcher Premium. That's right. Just go to stitcherpremium.com or the premium tab in your Stitcher app and sign up with the promo code CBB to get a free month of premium listening. You get ad-free listening to Comedy Bang Bang, all your favorite Earwolf and Stitcher shows, plus our full episode archive and your premium subscription helps support us and the show directly too. That's stitcherpremium.com, promo code CBB for a free month of Stitcher Premium. Thanks! Hey everyone, Scott Ackerman here, and welcome to a very special episode of Comedy Bang Bang. Let me give you a little bit of background about what you're about to hear. So, as many of you know, if you've been listening to the show over the past few months, we have become here at Comedy Bang Bang not only America's podcast and the world's podcast, but we've become the preeminent Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles podcast here at Comedy Bang Bang. Now, how did this happen? It all started a few months back when Sprague the Whisperer, one of our uh, recurring guests that we've had on many, many times, if you don't know who Sprague is, he is, uh, uh, <laughs> I think he's a manager <laughs> and a producer. Uh, he's been on the show very often. And uh, a few months back, I let it be known that I did not know anything about the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. And Sprague is sort of a Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle super fan. And so we got to talking about it, and, and we've been talking about it now for several months uh, here on Comedy Bang Bang. So Sprague and I decided to start a podcast about the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. So you're about to hear the first episode of this. We're calling it We've Got to Stop Talking About TMNT on CBB. <laughs> and... Uh, this is the first episode. You're about to hear it uh, as as one of our bonus uh, comedy bang bang episodes. Now we this episode is just uh, Sprague and I talking about the first movie. Uh, we have recorded several other episodes with a lot of great guest stars. Uh, we have Jason Manzukis and Tatiana Maslany and Christian Brune. Uh, if he knew out away, so many great guests, uh, that we talked to the turtles, uh, with them about, but, uh, if you want to hear the rest of the episodes, uh, you'll have to go over to Sean Diston's Patreon. Now, Sean Diston is a client of Sprague. He's a comedian, very funny comedian. He has a Patreon where he puts out podcasts every month. We are putting this out, uh, bi-weekly for the next, uh, few weeks, as long as we can do it. And if you like episode one, episode two is actually available right now with Lauren Lapkus talking about Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 2, The Secret of the Ooze. Here's what you do in order to get it. You go to patreon.com slash Sean Diston. And Sean is spelled S-H-A-U-N and Diston is D-I-S-T-O-N. It's only $5 a month and you get so many great podcasts and we'll be doing this for the next few months. So until then... I don't know why I said until then, but uh, right now, enjoy the very first episode of We've Got to Stop Talking About TMNT on CBB. All right, here we go. Microphone's on. All right, here we are. Sprague, let's get going. Scott, testing Scott. All right, here we go. The house that Freddy built. That's the nickname for the one-time indie film studio that went from distributing propaganda films like Reefer Madness to producing horror classics like Nightmare on Elm Street. Freddy Krueger, the wisecracking nightmare-invading killer, ruled the 80s and launched the careers of Wes Craven and Johnny Depp. But more importantly, it allowed New Line Cinema to look for new projects. New Line had their first commercial success on their hands. 
But it wasn't until 1990 that they would agree to distribute a low-budget comic book adaptation already in production in North Carolina. It wasn't until opening weekend that they knew they had a hit on their hands. Turtle Mania has taken over the world. It launched a billion-dollar industry out of a kitchen-drawn passion project of comic book nerds Peter Laird and Kevin Eastman. The Ninja Turtles IP transformed New Line Cinema, forever making them the movie-producing powerhouse we know today. So while Freddy built the house of New Line, it's safe to say movies like Lord of the Rings, It, Austin Powers, Rush Hour, and Elf all run on turtle power. This week on Doughboys, we're talking Ninja Turtles 1. From one to out of the shadows, we're talking turtles, that is. This is We Have to Stop Talking TMNT on CBB, the comprehensive and encyclopedic compendium of all thing turtles. This is good Ninja Turtles, uh content with me as always is my co-host as scott ackerman yes that's right scott i feel like <laughs> this no is one the first episode well i feel like no one sees sees or hears from me without you you know oh that's very kind of you to say you've been on my podcast uh comedy bang bang several times although you have your own podcast from what i hear I've, i'm fucking around on on sort of the patreon right now but i, I don't know how to host a board you know did you get a triple double I, um, fuck, I fucked around and got a triple double ice cube style. And, you know, I, I don't know how to host a pod, Scott. You know, I, I feel like I sort of fucked up the intro, but, but yeah, I, 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 do, I do have to say that at a certain point you said today on Doughboys. Yes, which I did say Doughboys. So the, yeah. you, you did tell me to sort of listen to a Doughboys and take notes. So I did that. Well, I, I told, <laughs> I, I said, you know, be inspired by what Doughboys did, put put your own fresh spin on it. I didn't yes, say just yes. copy what Doughboys did, including the name of their show. You told me to introduce myself as Nick Weiger, and I sort of was like, I'm not going to do I that. I don't think that I said anything <laughs> I like that. I think you but... did, because you were like, this guy's going to shit together in a way that sort of... Well, he is, uh, he, did do the, he is the number one guest on Comedy <laughs> Bang Bang. So. <laughs> That's interesting. Number one guest on Bang Bang, probably been on like, what, five times? <laughs> Seven, maybe, and uh, uh, all, all on Halloween. <laughs> <laughs> All sort of the same bit, you know, for some of these other guys out there really working on their cannon every day. Yeah, really. It's just every day working on the cannon. <laughs> they sort of get up, they do about 20 minutes of cannon sort of research. Sure, yeah, yeah. And it's like, this guy comes in, no cannon at all. And he's the number no. one comedy. Look. This is right. the slightest bit of canon. Well, well, yes. Well, I guess we're talking about Vulture or something, so we don't got to talk about that. Scott. No, let's today, not talk about Vulture. Let's talk about Turtles. Today, Scott, we're finally talking Turtles. And... Let me finally. just finally, finally, Scott, because this is an emergency co- podcast in two fronts, Scott. Front number one, me and Scott, uh, for, for people who haven't heard, I, I appeared on the podcast a couple months ago and I, I told Scott that I had the IP for the Ninja Turtles franchise. And of That's course, right. immediately hired Scott Ackerman, one of the best writers I've ever known. Thank to you be so the much. Writer. Although I don't know that you've ever read anything I've ever written, but thank you so much. I appreciate that. I'll take a compliment wherever I can get it. You do you write the sort of descriptions for the comedy bang bangs? I don't know. That's Jill Ideas. That's Jill Ideas. <laughs> Wait, you, I, you weren't. You didn't hire me just based on those because hold I on, really hold should on, hold abdicate on. my Wait position and give it to July. I got I got a hundred paid staples stapled script and I opened it. And it was, it, it said episode one, comedy bang bang. It was just a description. And then it went all the way to episode 600, Scott. And I was riveted by this thing. Yeah. So a 600 page script. <laughs> yeah. It was, you huge. were riveted. Yeah. I, no, that's July. You really, uh, I mean, I, I feel like if, if you were looking for the person who did those, maybe, maybe we should just stop this podcast right now. Okay, so July. I'm going to write this down because you might need him to do punch up or something. But don't anyways, just write down July because that's the month we're in. And I'll I'm, write I'm down, really worried you're going to get confused. Here's what I'm going to write down July, punch up. <laughs> okay, no, this is very confusing. And I'll say maybe the 15th, you know. <laughs> okay, no, this is. This, no, you're going to need to be a little more specific than that. But in, um, in any case, okay. you were on my show. We, we brought up the Ninja Turtles because 
by the way, thank you so much for having me at, at Whisper Studios here. You, this is- uh, first of all, Scott, thanks for coming down. I know it's weird with the quarantine stuff, but it, it, I'm glad you came in. We broke core a long time ago, so we've been doing Yeah, you've business. been having people <laughs> in and out of this place <laughs> yeah, since what? Been, so- since like March? I'd say since like, you know, March 15th. Maybe we <laughs> yeah, never. That's, maybe that's we when never. I started my quarantine. <laughs> you know what? Maybe we never quarantined. Now yeah, that I think I don't about know it, you did. I sort Just- of were coming in every day. This place, it's like a, uh, uh, I'm surprised by it. It's like a, it's sort of like a lair. So a, well, a lot of people come in here and they're like, is this a man cave? Just because of the sort of cave, I mean, like. It's like man cave minus man. It's like, it's like cave, you know, it's yeah. like bear cave. But we do yeah, have a flat minus sc- bear. It's we just do a cave. Have, we do have a flat screen in the, in the waiting room though. And we have yes. whisper studio lighters in a big bowl that you can take up. Yeah. The one, uh, amenity here at whisper it's, studios. Yeah. We don't give bottles of water for our meetings. We just hand out lighters. I am so parched right now, by the way. Do you have I anything? Know. I mean, it doesn't have to be in a bottle. Is there some mm. sort of babbling stream? No, we have hot tea in the, in the kitchen. And that's really all we have. How hot are we talking? Scalding hot. I, I don't uh, know yeah. how to, you know, those cups that they had in Kirby enthusiasm that heated up the coffee. Sure. Yeah. Of course. We, yeah, we, classic curve. The classic. It was the, the newest season, but we have sure. those. So we don't drink anything cold here. It's, it's cave rules, you know. <laughs> sure, cave rules. <laughs> it's no it's cold complicated. Beverages. You know, we had to, uh, when we bought this cave, we had to sort of uh, adopt a lot of the cave rules for this sort of maniac guy that lived in here. So there was a maniac guy that, that insists on yeah. you keeping up with his traditions. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So he had a house in Los Feliz and then one day walked away from it and just walked straight into a cave in, in Bronson <laughs> Canyon. And that's, of course. Squatter's was, rights, of course. Squatter's so rights. He, so he owns it at he that point. He owns it. So he would go. He sort of was like, now I have two houses. He'd go back and forth from his Los Feliz house to his cave house. He built out the cave house. But he was like, when we're in cave house, we've got some cave rules. And one yeah. of them is only hot tea. So <laughs> only hot tea, yeah. By the way, mm-hmm. is this the Batman cave which is right off of Bronson? It, it's interesting. You know, a lot of people think it's the Batman cave. That cave it sort of smells, Scott. Oh, it does, really. Like yeah, like what? It smells Okay, so you know when you do like a production, you know, and then like there's there's all these like food trucks and there's like all this shit and then there's just garbage everywhere. Sure, yeah. Nobody cleaned that shit up after the Batman. After the Bat So they they just had <laughs> Adam West's catering. Wait, when you go over there, it says Adam West's catering. You can still see the entire production. They just sort of walked away from it. It's like a zombie <laughs> production town. So the whole so cave, it's sort of like the Deadwood town. It's or? sort of like the Deadwood town, but it was just Anthony smells. Jeselnik doing accounting. <laughs> Dude, I don't know anything about that, Scott. <laughs> okay, well, check it out on his IMDb. I'm going to look that up. Just look IMDb. I'm going to write that down. <laughs> sure. <laughs> right next to July 15th. <laughs> July 15th. What was that about? It's probably the day <laughs> yeah, that we never to... mind. Never okay. mind. Uh, but, so, so, yes. So, you were on Comedy Bang Bang. Yes. Now, if there's one thing about Whisper Studios I know, is that you love to put ninjas in all of your productions. That's right, Scott. From... Um, Three ninjas to six two ninjas, ninjas to one two ninjas. ninjas to Beverly Hills Ninja to uh, Beverly Hills Chihuahua Ninja. You know, it's a lot of that. But but right now we're trying to branch out a little bit, Scott, like I talked about before. You know, right. we're doing some other productions. You know, we've got a Pretty Woman reboot. Oh, you do? Oh, I, I, I don't know that we talked about this. What, oh, we exactly haven't talked about this. It? Oh, the Pretty Woman reboot. So what happens is so... This so Richard Gere, you know, he's coming back to Sir him. Richard Gere. Is that what you Sir said? Richard Gere? He, that, he's he's knighted, right? No, I don't believe he is. Anyway, the gerbil so, might be. I think he's. <laughs> <laughs> that is an unsubstantiated rumor. That might be kind that of. That I so... am happy to keep going. <laughs> <laughs> it's like one of those I, joke I, rumors, you know. He's probably in on it at this point. Yeah, I heard he had it up there the entire Pretty Woman filming. So I think that might be something we do this time. Okay. I just put it in the credits like one gerbil might have been harmed in the making of this movie. <laughs> if he had that credit in every movie that he put out. It I just mean that might would, have been. It would be so fun might just have to been. fuck with the fans, you know? <laughs> he loves fucking with the fans. He, he loves him. Gear loves fucking with the fans. So anyways, this Pretty Woman reboot. I think it, maybe it wasn't Richard Gear. I don't even know who's in that movie. So in this Pretty Woman reboot. I, a pretty Woman by the way, another movie I've never seen. Never seen Scott. Did it come out the same year as Ninja Turtles 1990? Did you just have a movie blackout or something? Let's I, see. I have to say there are certain movies that I've never seen. Holy shit, I... Scott. It did come out in 1990, Scott. Yeah. So, what was so going there, Let's talk there, about 1990. Are, we should talk about it. There, there are certain movies that I've never seen out of uh, spite 
out of like mm. they they were too commercial or whatever for me at the time and so i've just never seen them pretty woman is one of them were you one of uh, those sort of like indie kids that was like fuck all this new movie shit you know i sort of became one of those in like 1989 or mm. so like mm. i sort of started getting taste and being very snooty and so from <laughs> 1989 to maybe 19 19- 99 the only movies i saw were like indie movies and then if you look i i made a list of every movie i've seen by the way <laughs> and, and, that's a uh, very nick weiger thing to do. yeah and uh i've noticed that i would go see only indie movies and then the biggest like action blockbusters there were <laughs> so wow. so your armageddon's your the rock mm. all that kind of stuff and then just all these indie movies but in any case yeah i never saw pretty woman mm. so this all came about because uh, you you like to put ninjas into everything. By the way, did we did we close the loop on the Pretty Woman reboot? What is happening? No, I, oh, I was just going to tell you. What happens is this Richard Gere guy he finds a sort of street worker. I, guess, I don't know what to call them. I'm sex worker. That out. Sex worker. There we go. Yeah, Why does he sure. street worker? It's not like she's like <laughs> she's not like riding you're on a sweet sweep or something. <laughs> yeah, you're thinking of street walker. Actually, but, hold on. But you hold wanted to make on. it a little more politically correct. <laughs> so she's not walking. She's working. I'm changing the whole thing. Let me write this down. She's driving a street sweeper. This is not bad. <laughs> okay, so what about a Zamboni? Oh, street Zamboni. Scott, you're street on Street Zamboni! <laughs> okay. So she's driving a street Zamboni. Richard Gear sees her. He's like, What are you, Paul? Come with me, I'm rich. And then the movie sort of really takes off. That's the inciting incident. Thing. That's sort of the inciting incident. And, and we're okay. trying to keep ninjas out of it for now. But look, Scott, if we get down the road and this thing's still pretty boring. Well, I got to say, you know, that uh, I, I was reading uh, uh, a, a great column by Tom Brehan, one of my favorite writers. I, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. But he does he does articles about film on mm-hmm. uh, AV Club and he does articles about music on Stereo Gum. And uh, he was talking about the 80s, about how. In uh, for some reason, every movie in the '80s had some sort of of mob mafia subplot in it, because the 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 plots, the regular plots of movies in the '80s were all these like they captured America's fancy. So like three men and a baby. Wow, mm-hmm. the idea of these three guys raising a baby, great. But then they realize they have not enough script. Movie, Essentially, right. they don't have enough movie, so they throw a mob subplot into it. <laughs> And every movie had one. We're like, this sounds suddenly, like Sister Act, you know? Yes, <laughs> exactly. Like, throw a mob thing into it, and then you have a third act. And then you hire that one guy that was in Sopranos that sort of has that, like, rounded, like, hair. Man, I don't even remember this guy, but he's in everything. He was in, like, this movie. Are we called- talking about James Gandolfini? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, James Gandolfini. Or Lorraine Bracco. Uh, no, no. There's a guy from, like, the background of all these Soprano scenes. He's also the, one of the goons in Cop and a Half, which is a movie okay. about a I little I feel kid. like this is the, also the guy from... Okay, what did I just watch the other night? I watched... Uh, it was... Oh, 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 Eraser! Eraser! It might Arnold be, Schwarzenegger. It might be the same guy he's, from Eraser. Scott. He's uh, uh, there's, there's a ludicrous subplot in Eraser where uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger, who plays the titular Eraser... Of course. And whose uh, 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 catchphrase is, you've just been erased. He, Sick uh, movie. Which, by the way, the villain turns it back around on him when he's on he's on a computer and he's like trying to download the information, which in the 90s, that was the third act of any uh, any 90s movie, is downloading yeah, it, the information. It, it was like, turn on the computer, <laughs> like figure it out. 96%, almost there. <laughs> and he's he's downloading the information and the villain turns it back around on him by talking to the guy in charge of the computers in the, at the building going like, is he in there? Go find him, find him. And then suddenly the eraser, the titular eraser, before he can download the information, a screen comes up that says, you've just been erased. And then Ooh. guys burst in and kill him. And I'm like trying to think of the, the, the sequence of events with the villain where he goes, okay, you found him? Now, can you program something in there <laughs> So his screen sees his own catchphrase. Is that because, possible for you? And, to do? and if that takes a few minutes, we've got time. Like we've got, he's only at ninety-seven percent. He's still got three percent to download. So we're that's okay. So crazy to me. But in any but case, I, there's there's a ludicrous subplot about uh, uh, the mafia on the docks mm. there. And and is this the guy that we're thinking of? The guy I'm trying to figure out who it is, but he's literally in every Bob thing ever. This guy analyze he this, analyze that. He must have been so pissed when they like analyze with a bit, wiffle ball bat. Yeah, he exactly. <laughs> Sure. He must have been so pissed when they stopped this 
mob subplot thing you're talking about, Scott. Because- oh, it was the, it was the glory. Well, that's the thing. Like all these mob guys had, it was just salad days for so long in the eighties. And then suddenly in the nineties, <gasps> it dries up a little bit, but then Sopranos comes around and then Ooh. you're like, Oh, Bafungu. Oh, Sopranos, you know, you know, Sopranos is sort of the, like, it's sort of the game of Thrones for, for British actors. You know, it's like game yeah. of Thrones for British actors is Sopranos to just like mafia for Italian guys. Americans. Yeah, you know? exactly. Yeah. They're all in it. It's so great that that. Yeah. That or it's like uh, a law and order for New York actors. They're like Broadway people. <laughs> exactly. Or, or like know? comedy bang bang for like indie comedian. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Well, I, I would like that if it, if, it if somehow not. it were considered to be the Sopranos of podcasts. It was the Sopranos I, of the sort of Indian LA comedy community. The, uh, Serial was the first podcast. That was the train coming straight towards the camera. Mm-hmm. And then cut to Comedy Bang Bang being the Sopranos of podcasts. I Congratulations, that. Scott. But we brought up this mob thing because we were just talking about, I love putting ninjas we, stuff in movies, yes. of course. We may need to add ninjas in order to do what we're talking about yes, into yes. this Pretty Woman reboot. We'll figure it out, Scott. We'll figure you it know? out. But, but, but right now we're figuring out our, our main project, which we've been which way behind on. We're way behind on the turtles, Scott. So, so what happened was we were talking about the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, which came up on the show. And I realized that I have no connection to the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles franchise. I have barely seen anything regarding them. And all I had in my mind was one mental image. I'm shaking my damn head, Scott, already. <laughs> you certainly are. And and it's this. It's that I and I inquired as to whether this happened in the movie, whether I saw it in a commercial. I don't know where I, I pulled this from. But the Ninja Turtles, at some point, <laughs> they see a manhole cover and it's circular, so they think it's a pizza. So they bite down on it and say, Ow! And they and maybe they break their teeth. That's the one image that I had from it. This was some fever dream you had, Scott, after like sort of maybe falling asleep trying to watch Secret of the Use or something. <laughs> I just never never tried to watch any of these movies. I don't know anything about them. It's crazy to me that that would be your the lasting mental image. It's like you're not even there's a there's an iconic song, you know. There's sort of the weapons they use. There's the toys. You didn't even see the toys, Scott. There's a huge didn't, part. Didn't of it. see the toys. We I can I've done some thinking on it since then, and I can take you back a, and tell you a little bit about what I know about the franchise. Let's figure this out because if you're going to be writing this new script for the reboot, you sort of have to know the turtles, Scott. So let's see what <laughs> right. you know. Okay, so here's what I know. Um, back in the '80s. I, uh, of course, was reading a lot of comic books as a teenager, and the three hottest comic books that were around in the 80s were The Uncanny X-Men, and they were mutants, okay? Mm -hmm. You have the New Teen Titans, uh, the Marv Wolfman and George Perez, uh, uh, New Teen Titans. Those were the two hottest franchises, one being Marvel, one being DC. They even teamed up for a comic book. Uh, when they did a crossover, those were the two most popular. You also had Frank Miller doing Daredevil, okay? And and there were a lot of ninjas in Daredevil. So okay? wait, Scott, Scott, what are you getting at here? What I'm getting at is when I did hear about the comic book, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, and when I heard about it, knowing those three properties, I thought, oh, this is a parody of those three books. It's like a kid's comic that's parodying these three hot trends in comic books. And so I never picked up the comic. I heard I, I heard things about it. I think it was in black and white. That's all I really know about it. And I just never picked it up. And then when the movie, the first movie came out in 1990, I was 19 years old. And it seemed like it was a kid's movie, especially with, uh, I do believe I knew Corey Feldman was hired for, to do a voice. Mm-hmm. It seemed like a kid's movie to me. And so I stayed away from it. Now. Cut to, I want to say 2014, Mm. somewhere around here, 2013, 2014. This is a major cut to. I know this is. First of all, Scott, you just did a whole cut to incorporating my entire life. (laughs) Like, (laughs) I was born and I have now been uh, to the day we, to 2014. That's like my whole (laughs) frigging life. Okay. I, 2014, I'm sitting there in the Comedy Bang Bang television writer's room. 
for, I want to say, the third season. And the writers really want us to do a bit based on the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles going on the Oprah Winfrey show. <laughs> right, of course. Classic okay. clip. So, we, I know we watched that and, and tried to figure out some sort of take on it. And I mm. think one of them drank water at a certain point and it was dribbling. Okay, so maybe the manhole pizza thing is from that. Uh, okay. Th that's the only thing that I've seen them actually physically do. If the Ninja Turtles bit into a manhole on the Oprah Winfrey show, I'll eat my shoe. <laughs> okay. Because and will I you just, break your teeth and say, ow, ow, ow? I'll, I'll be like, is this a pizza? And then I'll, I'll chomp into it, break my teeth, because that, Scott, is insane. I, I have the image in my head, and that's the only place it could have come from. The only other Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles connection that I have is probably in 2014, 2015, somewhere around there, uh, I was doing, during Comic-Con, I was doing a live comedy Bang Bang episode and a live show in front of a great audience. Aquafina opened for us. Uh, it, was a, it was a great show. And two people came to the show and the, I, they had been texting me and saying they wanted to come to the show. And uh, they were under the impression that at Comic-Con, even at night, off site, everyone was dressed in costume all the time. <laughs> oh, so I they, think I know where this is going. So. They came to the show dressed as Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles <laughs> and then found out that no one was dressed up there. Uh, this was Tatiana Maslany and Christian Brune. This sounds like a Brune thing, I'll say. I did interview <laughs> Brune. It's a very Brune thing. I did interview Brune on my, my Patreon podcast and... Let's just say this is part of the course of Christian. <laughs> yes, exactly. So now it was keeping Tatiana from being recognized, although who knows if the Comedy Bang Bang audience would have flipped uh, over seeing her. But this is this is right in the middle of Orphan Black Fever. Mm. So she was able to to go unrecognized. And we got some funny, funny pictures of them dressed in these uh, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles costumes, which I don't even think, come to think of it, I think they were masks and maybe... Like, you know how when you used to buy a Halloween costume when you were a kid, and maybe you didn't have this experience, but I did growing up in the 1970s, you would get these prepackaged costumes at the grocery store, and it would, like if it were Spider-Man, you would have the mask of Spider-Man, and it would be a plastic mask with a rubber band uh, sta stapled mm -hmm. to two sides. But then the body wouldn't be Spider-Man's body. It would be like pictures of Spider-Man fighting. <laughs> I don't know. I don't remember this, Scott. What I remember is sort of a loose fitting cloth cloth, like sort of like this is what Spider-Man would wear to the gym or something. Like, <laughs> right. I think it graduated from there, from from where I'm talking about. But early on in my youth, that's what I remember is the, is is you would always be disappointed. Like, well, couldn't you make the whole body look like <laughs> Spider-Man? And instead it was just like like cartoon pictures of Spider-Man fighting and you have It feels have harder to do the, the pictures of Spider-Man. It's like so much work to like lay out a, a sort yeah. of t-shirt comic with Spider-Man. That's crazy. That's what story. I said, or that's what she said. I don't know which one applies in this. We, I mean, she might have said it. We don't even know who she <laughs> Definitely. is. <laughs> so those are, those are my connections to the Turtles. This that's is tricky, all I know. That's all I know. This is tricky because we hired you to write the new Turtles, not knowing any of this. I sort of was like, this is a comic book guy. He's going to know. You know, you, you mentioned all those other comics. Don't know how they're related to the Turtles quite exactly. But it, it's funny to me that you don't know anything about the Turtles, Scott, because to be honest, I feel like this shit's right in your wheelhouse, baby. I Well, look, I mean, I, like I said, I love those three comics. So if, if the Turtles is anything like those three comics, then, you know, I'm in. I, I, but at the so same you did, time... So you did end up reading the comics at a certain point. No, you I meant, never... No, I never ne did. I, I mean, those com when I say those comics, I mean, of course, oh, X-Men, right, right, Teen right, right, Titans, right. Daredevil. Uh, exactly, exactly. So, yeah. So, so no, I've, I've, I've never read any of the comics. I've never seen any of the movies. I, the, those three things are the only things, my only connection to the Turtles. Well, what's interesting, Scott, is the comic was famously dark. It was like for adults and not kids, you know? Really? Shredder is killed in the first comic, Scott. I think the brutally. The first issue? I think they cut his head off or something in the first Whoa. issue. It's insane, Scott. And it, yeah, you're right. It is, it is derived from Daredevil, of course. And of course, Teen Titans and X-Men, that's a part of it. And it did sort of start as a parody, Scott. But, you know, a lot of things start as a parody. For instance, this podcast. 
<laughs> sure. And now it's serious AF. This podcast is serious AF. I'm recording. I've got my quick time going. This, oh, this whole I mean, thing is working, Scott. Sure. So yeah. don't knock a parody. That's all I'm saying. Sure. Yeah, I mean, you're best. You're, you're friends with all weird, weird Al, Scott. Yeah, no, that's true. And you know what? I mean, Spy Hard maybe started as a parody, but then it, you know, it, it's legitimately probably my, if it were a James Bond film, it would be my favorite James Bond film. I go to agree. I don't, I don't love the James Bond franchise, Scott. You don't really throw you know, a ninja in there. That's what I'm saying. It's he, this, this old white guy is too good at beating people up. This guy doesn't know how to fight. He doesn't know how to do anything. You Scott. realize it's been several <laughs> different white guys. It's not just one guy who's nah, really old right shit. now. You know what, Scott? They're all old. They all suck. It's just like get out of here, you know. They're all womenizers. They're drinking too much. Just so chill. if it were if it were a young person of color, you'd be into it. First of all, okay. So if we were re- remaking James Bond, first of all, Idris Elba should have been James Bond years ago. Could you imagine? years ago? Yeah. Could you imagine Although Dan- Stringer Daniel- Bell? Dan- Daniel Craig is the best James Bond. So it's- sure, I guess he is. But you know what, Idris Elba, you would have been the black James Bond. <laughs> sure. I mean, couldn't? Here's the thing. Uh, Daniel Craig takes. Five years in between James Bond films, it's like get Idris in there to do the off years. That's what I'm, we should do. Okay, we should have the way that they have Star Star Wars. There should be like a main canon yes. and then like side secondary movies. canon. Yeah, it's of like course. oh yeah, this is the James Bond that's sort of like you know in Los Angeles, just sort of chilling. And what? And you know why? Why couldn't it just be James Bond's friend, 006? Like, like 006. James, James well, Brown. Well, 006, I believe, is the bad guy in Goldeneye, but it, maybe it's 004. Oh, okay. 004, who gives a shit? Double O something. I, I'm realizing James Brown is probably not the best, <laughs> not the best <laughs> name for him. Probably not. Well, look, I think it's still fun. It's one of those comic book Easter eggs. We're going to get into that a little bit later, Scott. Oh, Easter or eggs? A little bit of both. Oh, so, boy. So, Scott. He I mean, is risen. I told you that this was an emergency podcast on two prongs because, one, you've not heard of Turtles at all. And no, two, we've, been, we've been down that prong. Yes. We've been down on that prong for a long time. At we've this been point. down on that prong, baby. But the other emergency was sort of, I've been listening to Comedy Bang Bang recently. And like, it's, I feel like we sort of need to exercise this Ninja Turtles thing from the pod. Because every time sure. I listen, I like 30 seconds skip to the middle. That's the way I listen to podcasts. And mm. as soon as it starts, <laughs> it's like Turtles, Turtles. It's like, I feel like I've cursed you to talk about turtles on every episode of your show. Uh, yeah, I would. Ra- I don't want to talk about the turtles. I've never seen the turtles. I don't know anything about the turtles. So I, I, I'm glad. I would prefer not to talk about the turtles anymore. So let's try to get it out on this show. Well, Scott, we have to stop talking about TMNT on CBB, baby. Thank you. Yes, that's the I name of the it. pod, Scott. And and let me just say, as a Ninja Turtles super fan, I'm here to guide you through the canon, of course. Great. And I, I want I want to, of course, make sure you feel comfortable when I send you off on script with this. Because if not, I mean, we might have to find we is might have to find this is, July guy. Is there like a well defined outline? Like the, okay, yes, we've talked about or? we've talked about the beat for beat outline on the other pod, and I'll go through it pretty quickly. Scene one: April O'Neil's dead. It's a funeral. <laughs> Uh, so this, this yeah. is a continuation of the films, much like Superman Returns. Sort of. So the way that Terminator sort of cut out a bunch of the older canon and just started after two, we're going to be doing yeah. the exact same thing. Okay, this is the most recent Terminator, which was subtitled... Salvation Turtles. No, Salvation was the Christian Bale one, as I recall, what? where he yelled at the guy, the, the gaffer or the guy moving the... Yeah, what the? Yeah, when he was like, I'm trying to be professional, man. He's a really the, asshole. The guy there. moving the, the Terminator? Was he moving a Terminator out of the way? I think he was moving the big, like, metal Terminator with the red eye. He was like, I'm trying to get it into his frame. You're, you're telling me I can't do my job? <laughs> I think it's but, Dark Fate. Is it Terminator? Dark Fate. Dark yes. Fate? That's I, it. I, I believe so. Yeah, I think I just saw it. So we're doing sort of that with the turtles. And beat for beat, April O'Neil's dead in the beginning. You don't know where the turtles are. Dead as a doorknob. Dead as a doorknob. One turtle shows up to the funeral. He doesn't have his colors. You don't know which turtle it is. He, uh, and the colors are the way you distinguish the turtles? That's right, Scott. We'll get into that in the next segment. I'm going to teach you the whole thing. But beat yeah. for beat, he, doesn't, he shows up. He doesn't have his, his colors. You don't know who it is. It's an older turtle. Maybe it's like 1999 or something. <laughs> and he's an older turtle. He's, he's grizzled, you know. Is he uh, worried he, about Y2K? He's worried about Y2K. He's totally freaking out. He's like, I don't even want to have a computer. <laughs> Those plots from the 90s are over, he says. So... Uh, what happens is April O'Neil's daughter, of course, is is uh, tasked to uh, figure out who this turtle guy that showed up to her mother's funeral is. And she finds out all the rest of the turtles are dead. No. That's right. All the turtles are dead. 
And she finds the lamp from the third one, which brings them back in time. We'll talk I don't even want. I don't want to know about this at this point. Uh, but uh, there, there's, there's a video game called Turtles in Time, and what okay. happens is this older turtle has to go back in time, Avengers Endgame back style. Back in time. He's sure. gotta go back, back in time. And back in time. Yes, yeah, Scott. I think we, we. I'm gonna write that down. I feel like every time we what talk are you about writing this, down. I'm writing notes because I'm a note taker. So but what exactly are you writing based I'm writing, on what I was doing? I'm writing back in time, right okay. above July 15th. Okay. <laughs> back in time, July 15th. That'll help me figure out what's happening after this. So, sure. so they go back in time, Avengers Endgame style. They rescue younger turtles, and then he rescues a younger ver- version of himself. You find out it's Raphael. Hmm. And then Raphael becomes the new Splinter, and he is now the sort of Splinter for the new Turtles that we read boot him for Ninja Turtles 2. Okay, okay. I don't know. I mean, I, at this point, I have no connection to any of this. Look, so maybe we're going to have to figure it out, Scott, but a lot of the story yeah. beats play out in the first movie, Scott. So I think... Okay. I think so we gotta, should I watch it now, or what What do I do? So I'm going to sit you down in, in our sort of uh, bullpen over there. I guess okay. we just... We call it a bullpen, is, but it's, yeah, it's a it's corner a, of a cave. Yeah, and caves traditionally don't have corners. And for but for some reason, this is like a ninety degree angle corner. Yeah, I don't know how it, you got it in here. It was like forty five thousand dollars to get some guys to chip in a corner here, so we could put because you flat wanted a screen. corner office. Well, I wanted a corner office, and then we had to be able to put up a flat screen. And if you try to put up a flat screen on a curved surface, big, yeah, you run some big issues. Scott. Those curved TVs, though, that someone thought was going to be all the rage. Remember that from about. I think- 365 I, days ago, and then I'll they went I'll be honest, nowhere. the only people who kickstarted that thing were people who live in caves. <laughs> <laughs> and then when we realized we weren't going to buy the TV, the whole thing folded. It was a big mistake, Scott. Yeah, I understand. So I'm going to okay. sit you in the corner. You're going to watch Ninja Turtles 1, Scott, and then we're going to come back and we'll sort of do a breakdown so we can get into the script. Is that okay? That sounds fine to me, yeah. Let's, uh, All so, right, let's, so, so let's we're going to take, take a break. break. Okay, yeah. and then I think I'm when, hosting the pod, Scott. So let me, sure, let me sure, throw it a commercial. What I want to say, though, is, is when mm-hmm. we come back, I will have watched the movie. You will have watched the movie, and I'm going to throw it to commercial the way I sort of know how. Okay, here we go. How do you throw it to commercial? All right. All right, we'll be right back with more Comedy Bang Bang. All right, and we're back on... We have to stop talking TMNT on CBB and... Scott Ackerman just watched Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 1 from 1990. Scott, how are you feeling? Um, <laughs> <laughs> That's not a good sign. When you, ask someone, great. when you ask someone how they're feeling and their first response is a long um, you're not, in, you're not starting out great there. Uh, not, what I, not what I expected. Not okay. what I expected, I have so, to say. Especially since what I expected was with you saying, you're going to love it. <laughs> Okay, okay, Scott. Let, let's let's. What did you expect going in? Because I think that's interesting. Because a lot of people don't remember what this movie was like. I think I expected a certain level of craftsmanship that, that perhaps <laughs> was not demonstrated in this first film. No, I think that's absolutely insane, Scott. How dare you? All right, all right. So, I, so what- I, I guess I expected it to be. It was so popular. Mm. I guess I expected it to be like a Crocodile Dundee one, which, you know, had a level of competency Mm, that perhaps mm. this film uh, uh, sidestepped. Interesting. So you're saying it's an incompetent, stupid movie that no one should have liked. (laughs) Well... All right, we'll have to. We have a long way to go before you start writing the script, but I think I really want to talk to you about this, Scott, because I will say I I, I watched it. uh, So I was in the kitchen behind you, sort of watching you watch it. Yeah, with Dida. With that, of course. <laughs> and, you know, Scott, I, I love this movie so much. And, and I think <laughs> it, the problem, if you don't, if you think this one is bad, Scott, we're, we're, we're. Oh, no. I, here's what I assumed <laughs> after watching this. I assumed that number two, they're going to, the first one was such a hit that they're going to get an influx of money and, mm-hmm. and be able to, to make it a little more like, you know, uh, put, put, throw some money at it, and, and mm-hmm. where, whereas it might lose some of the magic of the original, whatever that may be, at least it would, it would look better. And, and... That is exactly what happens, Scott. But okay. the uncanny valley of these turtles, when they start making them look better, by three, Scott, it's like a Sonic the Hedgehog situation where you're like, the teeth are weird, I don't like the way they look. <laughs> oh, no. But, but I will say, Scott, I, I, okay, so for me... 
Ninja Turtles one is the best Ninja Turtles movie. Is the Uh-oh. best Ni- Ninja Turtles thing that exists. Thing. Whoa! I, and and I want to. Can I, I ask? Can I ask something mm-hmm. about it? Of course. Yes. Was was there was there a children's cartoon that yes. that came out? So let's talk about that real quick. So before the movie, there was the comic book, which was was very dark and for adults. But they were trying to make some some toys for this, and in order to make toys back in the day, you had to have a cartoon, baby. Sure. So. They produced a cartoon, and the cartoon is much different than the movie, and it's a lot different than the comic books. The, the cartoon is where they develop the different colors for the turtles. Okay, and the colors are the are what what identifies on them on their masks, of course. Okay, and you know, in the comics, are they wear. All... This is something that I couldn't quite tell from the movie. Are they wearing it's... masks at home? I guess I wasn't clocking it. They never, t- <laughs> they never take off the mask. I guess it's like under. It's like it's like a t-shirt to them. Oh, okay, sure. A t-shirt well, is they, the... they already have a shell, which is sort of a turtle's t-shirt. But... The shell is the turtle's t-shirt. See, Scott, it's hard for me to, to write you off this project because you just come up with fun jokes like that all the time. <laughs> oh, they're definitely more fun than the jokes that are in this film, which I okay. want to talk about. <laughs> so it's, we'll talk about the jokes. There's some definite bad jokes in this. But so the thing about this movie that's interesting is it's, of course, a very low-budget film. You've, you've talked about that, Scott. Yeah. It, it's Okay, so the first thing that comes up is you see Golden Harvest. Yes. Which is a classic uh, uh, Asian cinema studio. They're, they're a Hong Kong stunt and film studio. And- I, I, I Recently, I have watched quite a few Golden Harvest movies. Um, including Police Story 1 and 2. Mm, love and... those Jackie Chan. Those are some of the best Jackie Chan films because they just don't give a shit about explain. It's just all action. I love yes, those And movies. they don't give a shit about anyone's safety. Yeah, it's just like Jackie's, gets including it. the public at large. Right, right, right. Um, but also, you know, Bruce Lee. Uh, mm-hmm. uh, so, so I'm guessing, and I don't know anything about these films, but I'm guessing that Okay, here's here, so so it was a comic book and it was a cartoon. I'm mm-hmm. guessing that Golden Harvest got the foreign rights to do the movie and started filming the movie as a Golden Harvest production. And then, from what you said in the intro, New Line acquired it. Is that what, what New happened? Line New Line acquired it about uh, halfway through production? And and I believe you're right there, Scott. I I, I believe it was. It, it 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 was the same team that brought the cartoons. It was them. It was literally all about the toys, Scott. You know, we're okay. selling toys. If you've seen that show on Netflix, the toys that made us, there's a great Ninja Turtles episode. Oh no! I, I mean, we should do an episode about that. We should do an ep on that. We got to talk about it. But it, it's a. Well, but by the way, for people listening, we're doing all the movies here. I don't even think we made that clear. I don't this think is, we made it clear either. This is Scott just has, one in a series. This is one in a series. Scott fucked up and said, let's watch all the Ninja Turtles movie. And now he's sort of cursed. <laughs> yeah, he, I he, think I even said the modern ones. And <laughs> and I'm maybe, like, this is a big mistake, Scott. But I'll, I'm here for you, baby. Okay. I don't know. I don't know how, if at any point this podcast even ends in the middle of the show, it yeah. will be because we cannot stand doing it. It, it would just be because Scott says, you know what? Fuck this. I'm walking out of the cave. These, this, Look, shit th- sucks. this may happen with the Red Hot Chili Peppers show. <laughs> it may happen with this show. <laughs> At a certain point, we may just say, call it off and go. Scott Ackerman, a man who creates podcasts, he needs to think about walking away from. <laughs> <laughs> yes. The Fish Show, it certainly happened there. Uh, so, yes, this was a low budget film, Scott, and it was Golden Harvest, but it was the toy guys that were like, we got to keep moving. We've got to make a live action movie. So it was all sort of a orchestration from the entire IP, uh, which was Mirage Studios, which is Peter Laird and uh, Kevin Eastman, okay. the comic book writers. So they were like, let's make this movie. Nobody wanted to make it because of Masters of the Universe. That was a huge flop. Oh, that's right. I never saw that either, but it, it, was, it came out earlier. In it the was 80s. a huge flop, and there were some other comic was Super book. Super Mario Brothers, did that come out? I think that came out after? later, much later. later. Okay. But, Another but, but, one I have not seen. Yeah, and, and we'll do an app on that. Now, the... <laughs> the I don't know. What, what, okay, all right, Scott. You know, we signed a contract, so I can kind of do whatever I want. Now, what happened is they made this movie, and... It was, they got a director from England. And I want to talk to you about okay. this director, Scott. Now, the director, I, yes. weirdly enough, I think, I think the, the writer that I was talking about before, Tom Brehan, I was yes. reading his column before we started doing this show. And he was, the column that he writes is all about, he takes the number one single on the Billboard charts and he's reviewing every single one since the chart started. Right. Oh, that's, that's a great. So he's currently in the early 80s. 
And I, I was reading it recently, and he mentioned that the video director for whatever song it was, I can't remember what the song was, I can look it up, um, was a was a sort of veteran music video director who then got hired to direct the first Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles movie. Yes, so we're talking about Steve Barron, and I'll tell you the songs, the, the popular songs that he directed the music videos for. Okay. Billy Jean... Oh, the classic. Classic video. And you could sort of think about the like street element to it and sure, sort of apply yeah. it to and his the, Turtles and, movie. Yeah. And then take on me. And then also also think about the young kids in this Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles movie. That applies to Michael <laughs> Jackson <laughs> it, as well. It, well, you know, Scott, that... Well, we're going we're gonna to cut that out. I, I, you know, Scott... I, what? Why are we gonna, cutting that? Are you a super I, fan? I'm a... <laughs> I like to separate the music from the... All right, let's sort of get at that. So, Scott, this guy directed Take On Me as well, Scott. Take On Me, this is the song, this is the one that I read about. Yes, and this, this is, is the video... This is one of the best videos of all time. Can you describe it, Scott? Because I, I do think it's important to, to sort of set this director yes. up. So the, the Swedish band, uh, or Norwegian band, I can't recall, AHA, which is uh, the H is capitalized after a dash, but the A is uh, lowercase. Both A's are lowercase. Um, they have a song, Take On Me, which everyone knows, which in the video, I believe um, a woman is drawing a comic book um, that stars uh, the lead singer of AHA, and then she gets pulled into the comic book, I believe, I and believe uh, it comes to life. Is that is that? I believe that's essentially correct. what happens. It was and one of the a- first... first uh, in- Music videos with incredible special effects. It was incredible, Scott. And, you know, it's the iconic, like, drawn video, and it's just like the song and the video just go hand in hand. And I guess this guy then decided to make a sloppy-ass movie where there was no, like, thought put into it, I guess. I don't know. The, I guess The, the Teenage Mutant fucking... Ninja Turtles Yeah, movie you know, he also, he also directed Coneheads, Scott. Do you like that movie? Oh, boy. Okay, well, I will <laughs> say I've never seen Coneheads either. Scott, this is disgusting. I you, have you... the soundtrack. <laughs> How do you like the soundtrack? Soundtrack has uh, Bare Naked Ladies Fight the Power, I believe, and it also has uh, Red Hot Chili Peppers Soul to Squeeze, which <laughs> may come up on my other show. <laughs> Please bring um, up Coneheads on your other show. I do believe uh, we may. But uh, uh, yeah, it, it is interesting. When I think of Billie Jean and Take On Me, those are two of the most classic music videos, and they look expensive, and they were big, big hits. And then the, this movie, the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles movie, seems to have none of that professional sheen on it. Right, right. I guess let's talk about the turtles, Scott, and the suits. (laughs) Sure. Because I guess those were made by this unprofessional sort of dick guy, this sort of loser guy. I guess his name was Jim Henson. (laughs) Oh. Yeah, I guess Jimmy Henson made the turtles. So I guess this whole thing was sloppy and unthought. Look, Scott, what I'm saying is you're out of your damn mind. (laughs) Okay, Jim Henson made the turtle costumes. Now they were a nightmare to wear. You mentioned that... um, this production, this Hong Kong production studio was sort of notorious for people getting hurt in their movies. Right. <laughs> These turtle suits are one of the, the seven, we're going to have to figure this out, Scott, because they weighed like 70 pounds and Oof. the actors, and the actors wearing them in North Carolina were like having panic attacks from claustrophobia. That's and right. Like, I saw in the credits, it said it was shot primarily in North Carolina. That's which... right. In the summer. When there's the these, guys, these guys are wearing 70 pound suits with animatronics and machines running on the inside and doing fight choreography. And were they controlling the animatronics or was there that were th- via they remote were like, control? I think it was remote control. There was like multiple people per turtle. So they're not expected to be puppeteers during this as they, well. They're just moving around. They were just moving around. And, and, it, and I read somewhere that each of them lost about 20 pounds doing shooting. Wow. And, they were, and people complained about the shooting on set. So right now we're in suit development, Scott. And that's going to take like, because we're doing a live action version, of course. Yeah, we don't want to do the, uh, apparently the, CGI. the recent ones are CGI. Is that right? Yeah. And so we it's, don't want to do that. It's sort of like a Star Wars thing. I'll keep going back to that. Like the original like tactile feel of a Star Wars movie. Sure. You, know? you got the guy in the devil mask, sort you of like the, the guy Spider-Man in... Halloween costume. He's got, <laughs> he's got the devil all over his all over his pajama bottom. You've got devil guy. And then you get to the new stuff and it's all CGI. You got like a CGI ET in the background. It's like, fuck off with that stuff. Yeah. Now, now and, and the new movies, they go back to some more practical effects. And I think that's what we're doing here with the turtles. Okay, great. So this, were, were they shorter actors in the, but so they were adults? Or? They were adults, Scott. And the only actor who played 
who actually did the voice and was in the costume is I got to look up his name because you'll know this actor. I think his name is Pius, Steve Pius or something. Yeah. Is that the guy who's in the taxi cab? <laughs> yes. That's the guy in the taxi cab. Yeah. So, all, so he's all a, the- I saw him in the taxi cab and I'm like, oh, that guy is a well-known character actor or not even a character actor, just like a well-known actor who's been in a million things. I'm like, what is he doing in this? And then I saw in the credits that his name came up twice as the voice of one of the turtles and as <laughs> taxi the guy in the taxi cab. But you're saying he was in the suit as well. He was also he was the only one that was in the suit. Uh, Feldman, I believe, uh, just did the voiceover. And then there were like stuntmen that were in the suits that also made cameos in the movie. Like, for okay. instance, I believe the like uh, I believe the the Domino's pizza guy delivering the pizza in act one is Michelangelo. Which, by the way, I have to say, speaking of the pizza, yeah. um, at four minutes and 23 seconds in the movie, that's the first time that you see a manhole cover. And I got excited. Okay. All right. Um, <laughs> I, I and saw I, a thought, lot of, I thought, here we go. I saw Frank a lot just of, doesn't remember it. I saw a lot of the notes you were taking, and they were like, manhole cover, four minutes in. And I was like, Scott, that's not what we're doing. Well, then at eight minutes in is the first mention of pizza. I mean, this is, isn't this a big part of them? Yeah, I, mean, it's I, a I big don't know part. anything about them. But. So the pizza was actually added to the cartoon. It's not a part of the comics at all. Oh, so wait. So, so it goes comics, no pizza. Cartoon, mm-hmm. they love pizza. Mm-hmm. And then movie, they love pizza as well. And then movie, they love pizza. It's sort of an amalgamation of the comics and the movie, Scott. The movie, uh, and the, I ha- and the cartoon. The movie, I have to say, is sort of feels like. A movie where it's like, hey, you know everything about the turtles already, right? Like, really? We don't have to so go you don't this. think that? They- okay, Scott. So w- just in the beginning of the movie, you know, I do think they do a good job of setting up New York City. That's well, a- well, how how hard do you have to try? <laughs> it's uh, it's the fifth character well, in the so first, many movies. Well, the first shot is the Twin Towers, and then <laughs> yeah, the, so the, we're we're on shaky ground. We're right on there. shaky ground, but you know it's New York City. Then the next shot, I think, is like a subway or something, and you're like, all right, we're in New York City. Yeah, this is definitely New York City. Which, so they set. Uh, the- Yes. You know, being as it was shot in North Carolina, this, you know, they have to sort of cover that up. There was like three days of shooting in New York City, actually, and they just shot all the beginning and end of the movie there. <laughs> Great. But they do a good job of setting that up. But Scott, I think in Act One, you know, in April, of course, we're going to go, I'll go through the plot loosely here, but April O'Neil is mugged in the beginning and is saved by the turtles. And I don't know that she's mugged in the beginning, by the way. <laughs> she, it was a pretty late mugging as far the the movie is structured. It it kind of I, here's what I think. Okay, and tell me if I'm right. Okay, in 1989, Batman comes out, right, mm-hmm. and it's a huge, huge hit. And mm-hmm. so everyone thinks, in order to make a comic book book movie, we have to structure it like Batman. Now, Batman is structured kind of weirdly. Interesting. Where Batman starts with Batman literally foiling a crime, mm-hmm. and you don't you don't know how Batman came to be until the midpoint of the movie. Right, right and right. and you see uh the uh, jack nicholson shooting spoiler alert by the way if you haven't mm-hmm. seen you see him shooting is that the big long gun yeah probably <laughs> okay i remember the long gun I, I mean personally i look at it i'm like oh that's a regular size gun but you nah. think it's long interesting yeah 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 <laughs> i've got a little dick scott <laughs> <laughs> that's canon <laughs> that's canon Wait, by the way we're changing canon non-stop during this thing so people better be catching up Okay. Sorry, so Joker. In any in any case, I, I saw this movie and I'm like, oh, they are kind of approaching it from a you already know everything you need to know about the turtles. We'll we'll get to all of the stuff that's their canon like later on down the road, to the point where I, a person who knows nothing about the turtles, was fairly bored and confused in the beginning because there wasn't a lot of dramatic momentum. Okay, so let me explain to you what a master stroke is, Scott. Oh, okay, thank you. <laughs> a master stroke is when a writer does something so subtle. And so nuanced and so powerful <laughs> that you look back and you're like, that was a masterstroke, baby. Mm, okay. And to me, first of all, the first speaking scene of the movie outside of April O'Neil's report is her getting mugged. And she does get mugged by Sam Rockwell. <laughs> right. But there's, so, a lot, there's a lot of movie before that, but okay. Okay, I mean, look, Scott, I can tell you beat for beat every single thing that happened, (laughs) but uh, she gets robbed, and the turtles save her, and then the the reason I know this is the beginning, Scott, is because once they're celebrating saving her is when the title drop happens. 
Yeah, okay. So I feel uh, like we may need to watch... We, we're going to do an episode two where you rewatch <laughs> because I feel like you sort of missed a lot. So the, the master stroke I wanted to tell you about, Scott, is when April O'Neil is down with the turtles. She's now been saved for a second time by April O'Neil, uh, by, by Raphael, and she's been brought to their lair. And, and then Splinter has to explain who the turtles are. Right. And in that scene, the background fades to black and we get a sort of explanation of... The turtle backstory. I uh, mean, uh, yes, it we gives you the whole it. thing. No, he doesn't give you the whole thing. Okay, so it, first of all, <laughs> by the way, why is it shot like this? This is the guy who directed Take on Me. Why is it shot like the shittiest <laughs> thirty-five millimeter home movie that I've ever seen? I want to go back to the shooting style for the new movie, just to like you know, <laughs> just the way for they, that. Yeah, you know, know the way they did like why? They, they, I'm, I keep going to Star Wars, but they 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 brought the wipes back, you know, and the new ones. And to yeah, me, yeah, I want to bring. Wipes. I want to bring back the feel that you're watching this on a green videotape. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's so it looks so bad. But here's the thing I want to say. Mm-hmm. The the whole splinter backstory, he he in this in this flashback that you're talking about, he's like, first of all, can we just talk about the fact that he's doing an Asian accent? And so okay, it's, it's Kevin Clash. So we've got to talk about the problematic nature of this movie in general. Yes. So, a lot of problematic things that so don't necessarily for- hold up. April O'Neil makes a joke about Sony payments when she gets robbed, and I cringe yeah, by, so by Asian. Hard. No, when yeah, when Asian people come to to rob her, she's like, "What am I late on my Sony payments?" It's insane. It's insane. And and I truly, we're we're not working with any of that bullshit. In, in the Splinter movie. voice, at least he's a person of color. At least he's. It's Kevin Clash, of course, the voice of Elmo, and yeah. he's doing a sort of like sensei voice. And yes. It is problematic, Scott. Yes. But, I mean, they, here's the thing. They probably just didn't want to give it to an Asian person because he's the puppeteer and he's a talented guy. It literally like, was a sort of package deal. If you were going to get him to do the thing, he had to do the voice. I'm right. Like, so, in any case, but he he just says, like, okay, I had a master uh, that who I used to follow along with his, kung, or his, nin, ninja, mm-hmm, his secret mm-hmm. ninjutsu moves in my cage. Then we had to go to New York and I was fending for myself in the sewers. There's okay, so a lot in between there that he is. You're right, out. Scott. But this is what I like to call foreshadowing, Scott, because the an- yeah. the question is answered with the next flashback. Flashback. But my my problem is is that next flashback is really good, mm. and it hooked me into their story. But because it's structured like Batman, which yes, is the yes, only yes. movie that th- could be successful as a comic book, they they have it way late. If you put that at the beginning. I'm hooked, baby. I think you're right, Scott. In watching it behind you, I was sort of like, these flashbacks are a little out of order, you know? Mm, <laughs> she might exactly. as, He might as well just told April O'Neil the whole story. He's like, look, okay, so I'm going to get to the turtle thing in a second, but right. I'm but living First, you got to know about me. Look, <laughs> I'm, a giant, I'm a giant talking rat. That's weird, too, right? <laughs> that, to me, is the first thing we've got to figure out. And how did I become their dad? Like, that whole thing needs to get explained. Sure. But Scott, I will say those flashback scenes, I love them. I love the style of like all black shadowy background and the like. The Everything sort of, out of focus. Out of focus. You know, it's really dark. Like imagine kids going to see this movie and there's a splinter character telling a story where it was like they were in love with the same woman. So he followed her to New York and killed her and killed him. It's like, yo, this shit is dark as hell, Scott. Okay. It's, I mean, I will say it seemed, it seemed more juvenile than I thought it was going to why because a little a little uh rat started doing like chops and stuff (laughs) that feels like like childlike to you the the whole thing seemed very like aimed at six-year-olds i I also like in the second flashback when he's in america and he comes home from work he's wearing like a he's wearing like he was working in a coal mine or something (laughs) he takes off his construction hat it's very funny but what, I have to ask about that. There's there's a moment in there where one of the turtles, and I could not tell you the turtles' names, by the okay. way. We'll go through that right now. Um, but uh, one of them comes out of the movie Critters. He, <laughs> he needs some time off, and he goes he he goes to see the movie Critters, and he walks out of it saying, "Where do they come up with this stuff?" I literally, Scott, when I saw that, when I watched it behind you watching that, I was like, I totally forgot about this part. What a weird part! <laughs> Why are they taking a shot at critters? Like, did I try to figure make it out. critters. Or I don't even the same think so. I critters? don't even think so. I, to be honest, I think it might have been like a diss or something. It was no, so I, strange. It but might be you... a thing of like, hey, look, we know critters is out there. We just got to acknowledge it. We're similar <laughs> to critters. 
<laughs> it's like to to put out a movie and not acknowledge cringes, they're gonna get in trouble. You think so? They had to add this scene. I th- I have a feeling they shot that months later, where they're like, "Fuck, we got to address the critters thing." We got to look. <laughs> This is every note we're getting back at testing. The Everyone's saying, I already, yeah, I like this better when it was called Critters. The only reshoot we've got to do is Critters. So, yes, I don't know why that was in the movie, but I'll just walk you through the plot very quickly. It's a three-act movie. The first movie, the first act is where you're introduced to April O'Neil, you're introduced to the Turtles, and Raphael is sort of clashing with the rest of the Turtles. And this is sort of Raphael's canon. He's always the loner, you know? He is, okay. And, and he's upset. I couldn't quite figure out why he was upset. I know he lost his uh, uh, thing. Well, he's upset. <laughs> he lost his sigh, but he's ultimately sigh. upset because uh, Splinter gets kidnapped when he leads one of the Foot Clan back to their lair when he saves April O'Neil. Sure. Okay. So, but I don't know why he's so upset when he goes to see that movie other than he lost his sigh. He was pissed that he lost his sigh. Scott, have you ever tried to get a sigh? <laughs> <laughs> look, I, look, I have to agree. This shit is hard. One sigh is hard. He had two and they matched and then he lost one to some woman he didn't think he'd ever see again. Like, dude, I'd be pissed too, Scott. Yeah. What I like about how pissed he is too is how many times he says, damn. Did you notice that? I guess I didn't notice that. Yeah, you're right. I mean, the first line of any turtle in the movie is, damn. (laughs) And then he like goes into the sewer. It's very strange. Well, they all. Let's talk about their personalities because yes, yes. from what I could tell, one is like a surfer dude. Okay. You're talking about Michelangelo. And Scott, <laughs> it, it's important to know that the cartoon was the one that dis- that sort of set the personalities. They did. Okay. They did. And have you ever heard the song for the cartoon, Scott? No, I have not. So I- I'm going to ask you to listen to the song, but uh, interesting fact about the song, written, written and recorded by Chuck Lorre. Oh, the two and a half men guy. <laughs> the mega producer, Chuck Lorre. One Did of the he fr- make a ton of money off the cartoon and that's why he has like just a uh, ton of time to I'd sit around to writing sitcoms? Or? I'd have to look, but I, I couldn't. I I couldn't see why not. I mean, this the, it, truly the song is the reason the whole thing is popular. So he describes the turtles in a song and uh, basically it it's, goes as follows. Uh, Michael, Michelangelo is cool. He's a party dude. Okay. Raphael is cool but rude. Okay, they're both cool. All right, that's, <laughs> that's good canon. Leonardo, he's cool, but he's the leader. <laughs> <laughs> he's cool, but he's the leader? Yeah. And then so, Dona- that, so that's like, okay, he's cool, but... He's the leader. <laughs> why the but? And why not and? I don't know if that's in the song, but I just am implying that it's he's cool, but he's the leader. Oh, okay. And then Donatello does machines. Okay, so he's not cool. <laughs> so this is this is like the sort of letting him down easy. Yeah, like, he's sort of the wait, like geeky, not cool one. But in the cartoon, he does machines. There's not a lot of that in the movie, but that's sort of his personality in the cartoon. What machines does he do in the cartoon? Meaning he like drives it, a zamboni as well, a street zamboni. I believe in the cartoon intro, the animation is him sitting at like this giant supercomputer that is maybe 3D printing a pizza or something. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it's a manhole. <laughs> okay, Scott, maybe it's a manhole. <laughs> but um, so that, those are the personalities from the uh, co- the cartoon. But okay. in the movies, they really just have Leonardo as the leader, Michelangelo parties, Donatello's Corey Feldman, and Raphael is a bad boy. Okay, so who, who, does, the, who does the surfer voice? That would be Michelangelo. And who does that one? That's uh, Corey he, Feldman or no? That's not Corey Feldman. Corey Feldman's Donatello who does machines. The voice of Michelangelo. So here's an interesting thing about Michelangelo, Scott. Okay. Do you remember, uh, let me look up the name. Do you remember Cousin Oliver, Scott? Sure, from uh, the Brady Bunch. He was added uh, in a later season, and it's uh, a lot of people think that's when the Brady Bunch jumped the shark. Guess who grew up to be the voice of Michelangelo, Scott? <laughs> Whoa! No way. That, that's right, Scott. <laughs> it's him. It's the guy who played, what's his name? Robert Rist, I believe. Oh, Robbie Rist. Yeah, Robbie yeah, Rist. Yeah, yes. he had a. Didn't he have a band too, like a pop band as well? Ooh, great question. You know that you might want to bring that up I on your band. Feel podcast. like in the in the <laughs> mid nineties, um, when I was seeing a lot of like John Bryany, like Poptopia type stuff, that Robbie Rist was a player in that scene. But I have no idea. Interesting. You know, I'll I'll look into it, Scott. Maybe play a couple of songs. You do an album listening. Okay, great. But uh, he was Michelangelo, and he's also the the uh, 
He's also the Domino's guy. And there's he, like a New York guy, right? The the New York guy is Raphael, and that is the guy that was in the taxi That's cab. in the taxi cab. Okay, great. And then yes. and then what if you had to describe Corey Feldman's voice, what is he doing? What kind of voice is he doing? Uh, it's hard to say, but it's like a if 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 it's like a vocal fry. It's like I can't describe his vocal fry. Hey, this, what's yeah, going on? There's that like kind of a, thing? there's a bit of that. Yes, yes. And look. Donatello's just as funny as Michelangelo in this. I don't think they could just sideline him with just machines in the movie. I think they'd kind of sure, be boring. Sure, sure. So he I has had a hard jokes. time distinguishing all of the turtles. Yeah, myself. That's, why they, that's why they gave him colors. Maybe you need to see if your color okay. is good. But, but, <laughs> okay, thank you. But in Act 1, Raphael's pissed. He's like sort of separating himself from the turtles because, yeah, you know, Splinter's gone and he's sort of their dad. And, you know, after a heart-to-heart with Raphael, Raphael's feeling really, really vulnerable. So he goes up onto a roof and starts kicking and fighting, which was like a funny scene. By himself. By himself, he just starts kicking and fighting. And I think it's sort of like, what's that movie where the guy goes into the woods and just starts like kicking around? And what is it called? It's like, I'm trying to think of Footloose? any movie where anyone goes into the woods. Is uh, Footloose it Foot- is another one I have not seen. Scott, this is, I can't, we should just call this movie Scott hasn't seen. <laughs> <laughs> um, but anyways, Raphael is uh, injured in a fight with the foot. And the foot is the, are the ninjas. Yes. Who, have, who additionally have bad Asian accents. Yes, of course. And they are led by Shredder, who's this sort of like, he runs this sort of like lost boys, like runaway boys home for bad he kids. Has, he has sort of a Bane mask on, and he as well has pictures of Bane on his <laughs> cloak. <laughs> he definitely has Bane all over his cloak. It's like a 70s costume. <laughs> um, but yeah, he's, he's wearing a mask that obscures his face. Yes, but and there's something about these turtles and the way that they've, they've described their fighting that reminds him of something. Reminds him of something. I will say he's the antagonist, and he does not show up for a long-ass time. Yes, that's right. So that's what if... I kind of mean by dramatically inert a little bit. Mm-mm. So if you were rewriting this, you'd say what? Shredder in the first first scene? What? No. Well, no, 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 no. I mean, you basically, like, you want to make it uh, one-sixth of the way through the movie. You mm. want to establish your antagonist, probably. So maybe it's they, they, they're fighting this guy. They're fighting a guy from the foot. And they're like, tell us what you know. And he's like, I can't, I can't. Shredder will kill me. And everyone's like, who's Shredder? Who's Shredder? And then Shredder's right behind him going, Shoo-choom. I'm the guy who just killed him. <laughs> okay, we're going to have to save that choo for later because that's the way he sort of pops into Act 3. Oh, okay. um, but Act Act 1 is in, in uh, New York. Raphael gets injured and they have to retreat. To a cabin, Scott. And Should we we a- got to talk about Elias Coteus, too. Because- We've got to talk about Elias Casey Jones, Scott. So tell me what you know about Elias, Scott. Okay, so I'd, 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 I had heard of April O'Neil, okay, and that, that right. she was a friend of the Turtles. I didn't know I- anything Iconic. about her being a reporter or anything Iconic. like that. I have never heard of Casey Jones. I don't know whether he <laughs> is part of the cartoon, don't know whether. But Elias Coteus pops up in the movie, and one of the Turtles, I'm assuming Raphael, I don't know. It's Raphael. Uh, he's, the, uh, he's cool but rude. He's cool but rude, but he subdues, in a cool but rude way, uh, three pickpockets, and then Elias Coteus wearing hockey gear, I think, mm-hmm. bursts out of the, uh, bursts out, and then is going to kill them <laughs> with his hockey stick. Yes, go. And then Raphael says, "Hey, don't kill them," and then they fight, and they're and they're enemies from from what I could tell. Yes. Now, Scott, that is pulled directly from the comic books. <laughs> now, it is. It is. I think even line for line is from like a, 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 where they're like, all right, pal. And the whole like uh, Jose Canseco bat thing. And oh, the whole... yeah, by the way, what is, this? there are several jokes I do not understand. Same, and, uh, same I, Scott. I, I believe this is one of the first ones. He says, uh, he says that, he says something about, a, hey, is that a Jose Canseco bat? Tell me you didn't pay money for this. Yeah, I, I don't... Is that a slam on Jose Canseco? Now, I, I feel like he was a Met or something at the time, so it's an interesting slam. I, I don't, I'm going to look that up, Scott, because that, to me, puzzled me, too. There were a lot of jokes where I'm just like, I don't know what this is from. It's from, like, a 1930s movie. I think, he d- I think Michelangelo does an impression of Cagney or something. In the- <laughs> oh, no. At a certain point, they start doing impressions. One, one of them does the worst Stallone I've ever seen, and it, April O'Neil is cackling. She's cracking up like it's a good impression. And, and then I'm the like, next person on. says, starts doing a Cagney impression, and then April O'Neil says, Shredder must love that. <laughs> and then... And then they all go, Splinter, sorry, sorry. Splinter must love that. 
And then everyone gets silent. And she goes, what? It was a joke. And then they all laugh like, ha, 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 ha. No, we got it. We were just fucking with you. Scott, what does it mean? Scott, the line is you dirty rat. Uh, you know, Scott, this is why we're going to have to do a rewatch. So we're going to do a, a season one of this pod and then the rewatch season where you're sort of a re-watch. fan and you're like, and you're sort of like getting like Easter eggs and stuff. But can yes, we, it, can we, can we talk about two, a uh, few other jokes I just don't get just to please, see if you let's, can explain them to me. This is a segment of the pod called jokes. I don't get. Can you explain them? <laughs> so at a certain point they're underneath in the sewers mm-hmm. and they say, they say, are we where we're supposed to be? And someone says, do you mean like 13th and Broadway? And some, <laughs> someone sniffs and goes, no, we're only on 9th Street. Get it? And then April O'Neil <laughs> says, yuck. So I, I guess what, what does I, that mean? I think maybe at the time, the Hell's Kitchen neighborhood in New York was sort of a slum. You know, it's the same place that uh, Daredevil is from, Hell's Kitchen. Oh. And I think it might be a reference to that. So it's general. a very specific New York street slam. It's a specific New York street slam that might be an Easter egg for Daredevil. Got it. Okay. This is makes... it a good joke, Scott? I don't think so. And I think you're finding, you're the one who's going to be writing the new stuff. So like, figure out what works and what doesn't, you know? <laughs> okay, I guess. Uh, there is a certain point where someone says, time to switch to decaf, April. Which yeah. doesn't make sense in that particular situation, but it I, is a joke that is like commonly you'll find it in movies where people go time to switch to decaf. Yes, I think uh, what I think it is is I think she had just been flustered by something because her boss was in the house, and the turtles had to hide while her boss was walking around her apartment. Right. So as she's flustered and closed the door, she's like, ah, ah, ah. and Michelangelo's like, you better switch to decaf. I don't think it's a good joke either, Scott. You yeah. know, it's a big reach to me, but. I'm there, writing these down. There is a certain point where one of the turtles decides to to spin on his back and he says, California roll. I <laughs> guess I'm guessing because he's the one with the sort of surfer accent. I think yes. I don't the California roll of it all doesn't make any sense. Like he could have said like rainbow roll or sort of anything, like you know, is there like an orange roll or Michelangelo roll? I don't know. It's just not a good joke, Scott. Yeah. But if you but if you follow the movie, Scott, they realize their jokes aren't great. And towards the end, they're pitching jokes to each other. <laughs> yeah, but they're pit- and each one is worse. And then finally, on the third one, someone goes brilliant or so- or excellent, excellent or so- it, yeah. The the jokes aren't great, Scott. But this movie is about the grit, the gore, the the. the, the... Now the heart of the movie is Act Two, Scott. But before we get into it, I think we have got to take a break. We got to take a break. Yes, we let's should. take a break. Um, we'll be right back with more more Doughboys. Or no, no, we'll be right back with more CP. No, we'll be. All right, we'll be right back with whatever this podcast is. Two power. Two power. All right, and we are back, and we were just about to jump into Act 2, which to me is the heart of the movie, the cabin scene, Scott. Is this truly Act 2? <laughs> this is a very poorly structured movie. I so think, they, yes. the, Elias Coteus, who's, by the way, a good actor, and I, I really liked him in Some Kind of Wonderful, which is maybe how he got this gig because he was so charismatic and magnetic in that that he's playing sort of the comedy character in this yeah and this movie was considered an indie film at the time so it might have been that sure kind of thing. and uh by the way he was uh speaking of new line he was married i believe at the time to jennifer rubin who was in uh nightmare on elm street uh three dream warriors maybe that's how the, the whole connection it's the dream it's the new line family yeah so uh he he helps the turtles out and then they have to go to this cabin, which yes. he looks at the cabin and says, like, hey, didn't didn't they use this in the Grapes of Wrath? And then April says, very funny. Yeah. Is I don't, it really? I don't understand. Yeah, I don't think it's funny either. I will say a lot of the jokes you can sort of be like, it, it, it was like a lot of this, like, Saved by the Bell and those kind of shows at the time. It's like, you know, all these j- jokes were written by, like, old, old men that were just yes. like, <laughs> I'm referencing 1930s movies. I think Stallone impressions are funny. Yes, we did a we did a, a sketch on Bang Bang that Dan Klein wrote uh, wh- that was sort of based on this, which was we were noticing that you know how when you watch a show and you can just tell who's in the writer's room yes um so like i was watching rupaul's recent netflix sitcom and every character talks like a drag queen even if they're not a drag queen <laughs> but but we were we, we did a sketch about a sort of like teen soap opera that was written by super old jewish writers <laughs> and they all talk about like jewish that's what this reminds me of is, is they're all like they're all jokes from other movies yeah that, 
Um, they're just references, you know, where people go like, hey, it, this is kind of like moonlighting, isn't it? When Elias like, Coteus and April O'Neil are fighting. You know? Yeah, it's it, there's a lot of like half references. I don't think they knew how to do that kind of thing back in the 90s. You know, they were just like shooting. Yeah. Like there, there's a TV show I used to watch called Out of This World, Scott. I don't know if you've ever heard of it, but it's... I've a, heard of it. I've never saw it. It's got a great theme song and it's about a young girl who finds out that her father is an alien. She never mm. met her father. She finds out she's half alien. And she gets powers every year. And it's this sort of teen every, sort of... She, she gets... Every day, every she year, continually has powers? Every year on her birthday, she gets a new power. For, the, so she gets an additional power? Or yes, she, she, gets she does, additional only power. has powers on her birthday? She gets them, and she can have them forever. She, okay, so every year she gets a new power. the power she has power. is stopping time, like Zach Morris. Oh, okay. So, but anyways, the reason I bring this up is because it's this like coming of age story about this girl that goes from like 15 to 18 in the four seasons, but it's so clearly she lives by... in the four seasons. She lives in the four seasons. Yeah. Oh and it's so clear that it's written by old men. Like the jokes yeah. that sh- this little girl is saying, it's like, they're all references to like, you know, like, <laughs> I mean, I, I was going to say stuff like references to Gilligan's Island or whatever, which there are references to in this in movie. This, but like course. when the Grapes of Wrath came up, I was like, <laughs> okay, well, what 80 year old guy is writing this? Well, Cagney, isn't that like a 1930s yeah, yeah. movie? <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's insane. So anyways, this is the heart of the movie. It's got the cabin. The cabin. And I will say, I will say one reference they make mm-hmm. is they say, this guy's like Wayne Gretzky on steroids. And, I, I thought it would be funny in our movie mm-hmm, right if we made references where it was like, this guy's like Mark McGuire on steroids. This and is then great. someone goes, do you just mean Mark McGuire? Yeah. Oh, Scott! This ah! guy's like Lance Armstrong on steroids. Now, Scott, you mean me, like Lance Armstrong. Let me ask you this, Scott. Now that you know the characters, who do you think would be the one delivering that punch? I don't know the characters. <laughs> I've watched this movie. I don't Jesus, know the characters. Scott. I think it's a Michelangelo joke, but we'll, we'll get into okay, it. Okay, we'll figure that out. So in the cabin, Scott, we they think Splinter's dead. Raphael is in a coma in a tub. And the movie becomes very April internalized. April O'Neil sprinkles water on him once and goes, she's, he'll be okay, and she, walks away. She, she like drink, she sprinkles water on him like he's free willy or something. Like, you got to keep him <laughs> wet for him to breathe. Um, but to, I'll be honest, Scott, all jokes aside, every single time we get to the cabin and I watch this movie, I am so drawn into this part of the movie. I think the cinematography Why? is absolutely she, amazing. Because she's, I will say this is the most aha the movie is because April O'Neil, who is, by the way, a news reporter, a hard hitting news reporter who apparently does, has, works on one story every day. <laughs> and then they repeat her story at five and at six o'clock, <laughs> so, which I didn't know news programs. That's how just, it works, Scott. Just repeated things. <laughs> Back in the 90s. Sure. But um, in any case, she's a reporter. She takes up sketching in the middle of the movie. This and part... she, she sketches the turtles, and then it segues from her sketches to them literally in those poses. And I was like, this is a lot like Take On Me, so it makes sense. Exactly, Scott. This was the Take On Me element. She's drawing the turtles, and she's sort of saying stuff like, with Raphael down, the other turtles are coping. Donatello's making jokes with Casey Jones. And then there's like <laughs> a really bad scene where they're just like in a truck making jokes, going by the alphabet, insulting each other, which I thought was yeah, a fine bro- yeah. premise, but like, come on, hose brain. A lot of the shit they say is stupid. Yeah. And at one point someone says, hey, how's the work on the truck going? And Elias Cotes goes, does that answer your question? Yeah, it's so, it, it's no. just, lo- it doesn't. It, I mean, I guess I could assume. It's going explosion? I don't know. You're, I think he was trying to shoot it to put it out of its misery, maybe? And he's saying, does this answer your question? I'm like, it just makes it a little more confusing. Yeah. I don't think he shoots anything, Scott. You know, I think he's a hockey stick guy. Uh, if, if you remember in the end of the movie, he has to have a stick that is associated with a sport in order to beat anyone else. <laughs> that, so he's a stick guy. He's not a <laughs> hockey stick guy. He is he, a stick he gets guy. A, uh, he gets a golf club, and he's like, hey, this is in my wheelhouse, baby. He's finally like, thank God there's a golf club here. <laughs> um, but the scene, okay, so we're in the cabin, and the turtles are all there. Raphael wakes up, and the scene where he wakes up, and like Leonardo's like, he's awake, he's awake. I truly am like, all right, I'm already welling sort of. I'm starting oh. to cry. Well, the other thing we should mention is Elias Cotes, Casey Jones, sorry, yes. and April O'Neil have a, a real will they or won't they, although it's just unpleasant kind of I'm thing. I'm going to say, I'm going to make it a won't they. I don't like that any of that I part of like that I don't like their relationship. I but don't at one like point, when he... Yeah, at ahead. one point, she walks in, and she's oh. like, got a, got a kink in her neck, and she's like, oh, and he 
forcibly sits her down I, I against hate, her wishes. Scott, I hate that butt. And it then he starts to grow. massage her, and he immediately goes down to her boobs. I, I, watching you watch it, Scott, I was like, I feel bad I'm subjecting my friend to this I, I feel bad if my boner was getting in the way of your view. I, of I will TV. say that that is a problem. We're going to have to talk about it. But, Scott, I will... Uh, to be honest, they should do a special edition where you just cut that scene up. There's no yeah. reason for it. And then Michelangelo comes in and gets turtle wax. Like, the whole thing is for a turtle as wax a, joke. As a joke, yeah. Like, like uh, he... I, what I was wondering is, do, does he actually put the turtle wax on? This is a great part of. We need to. Fi- I think for our movie, we have a, an Easter egg where there's an empty turtle wax can in the in like the in the bathroom. We're like, I guess he did use the turtle. I guess wax. he did use it. Maybe he's <laughs> using it to jerk off. I don't know exactly what's going on with this wax. But now we get to our scene that sort of thrusts us into the third act, Scott. They think Splinter's dead. Yeah. And early in the movie, Splinter says, "In order to master being a ninja, you have to master the body and the mind, Scott." Right. So Leonardo's meditating, which I guess is something the turtles do. <laughs> Not really established any other time. Yeah, of the movie. yeah. But, but he's then, doing the ohm kind of with his fingers. Yeah. He's sort of meditating and he sees a glimpse of Splinter, who's still alive and captured by Shredder. Right. And he goes to the other three and he says, Splinter's alive. I don't believe. I know. By the way, I'm just putting together Splinter is called Splinter because Daredevil's stick. master is called Stick. That's right. And that's a funny thing to be like a splinter off a stick. Is that right? Yeah, Scott. The whole thing is a parody, like you said. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> like, like the ooze that, that made Daredevil blind is the same ooze that, that made the turtles. I did not realize that either. Okay, did you not put that together, together, Scott? Okay, I think there is even a comic where you see that the ooze get to Daredevil. His eyes go whatever. And then the ooze rolls into the sewer. Oh, and then you see the right. start of the turtles. I think I've, I've seen that. I think that might be the first comic, Scott. <laughs> okay. So there's so much Daredevil shit in here, Scott. It's hard to even... That's what, I, that's what I'm saying. I think that Ninth Street thing is a Daredevil reference. Okay, okay, got it. So anyways, Leonardo thinks that Shredder's alive. And this, Scott, to me, this is the part of the movie that is a sort of non-starter. Like, we have to have this part in the reboot. We have to have the meditation where they see Splinter... And they all start crying. They all, yeah, inexplicably, <laughs> they are weeping. Not that, tears of joy either. No, they th- because Splinter he sort of apparates to them in sort of a Force Ghost style. And at the end Forced of it, he says, ghost? "Yeah, he's." <laughs> Do you mean Forrest Gump or no? Or he's, saying, a, he's a ghost in a forest. I'm I saying, can't... sorry, Scott. I'm saying Force Ghost, like Star Wars. Oh, okay. Because Forest Ghost. Well, they're is... in the forest in the scene, so it is a forest ghost. No, but this is a good idea for a different movie. All right, let me write Because Forrest Gump would be dead by now, wouldn't he? I mean, he's Holy lived shit. through so much history, but Tom Hanks is alive. Let's get him as a ghost. Forrest Ghost. Wait, you know Haley Joel, right? Yeah, of course. Yeah, get him in there. He'll, he's the only person who can see him. We'll get Haley Joel in there. All this shit's a six sense reboot. Scott, you're on fire. We've got to, we've got to sort of take this beam of energy, focus it back on the turtles here. Yeah, and, okay, sure. And just make sure that there's a way in the new movie that we get a scene where the turtles are like meditating together and Splinter's cry. dead, and then they start crying because <laughs> okay, his last make words. Sure that's in there. His last words to them are my final words to you, and I don't know why he says that because no one's trying to kill him. Maybe he just meant the final words of this communication. I think there's a weird miscommunication that causes them to all cry and mm. sort of forces them into act three. Think that maybe he's dead. Right. Maybe? I don't know. So they basically, they meditate, they do a speech that I used to have memorized for real, and (laughs) it is truly one of the, it's a heartbreaking scene where these four sons think their father is dead. The whole movie is about fathers, Scott. Yeah. Shredder, I mean, Shredder is a surrogate father for these runaways. The the side character, Danny, runs away from his father and is reunited at the end of the movie. So it's all about fathers, Scott. So write that down. We're, you know, Father's Day is sort of just passed. So we've got to, we got to, maybe we drop this on Father's Day. Next year? Uh, next year? I, yeah, I don't yeah. think we can wait that long for it. But. Okay. Well, me, yeah, you're right. This thing's got to come out now. So, oh, no, I'm talking about the movie we make. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, <laughs> yes, maybe yes. we call it Father's Day, and it's like an extension Ninja- of the okay. Father's Day universe with we- Robin Williams and uh, 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 John Travolta. That's amazing. We're going to talk about Robin Williams in a second here. Oh, we are? We are, Scott. He's got okay. a connection to the movie. So, Oh, wow. Uh, so they see Shredder. They think he's dead. And then they, they, they – my favorite scene of the movie is when – Casey Jones and like April O'Neil are sitting on that bench and they get interrupted by the turtles and they cut to the turtles. It's a fucking morning rise shot. Yeah. Which by the way, he's talking to April 
And the, all they do is clear their throat. They go, <clears throat> and he turns and says, guys, I told you. <laughs> I hate when you do that, all right? I guess they're trying to say, like, because they move so swiftly, you never hear when they're coming. But but they clear their a, throat to alert him I to their know. presence. It's not a well-executed joke. I'm going to write that down. The clearing throat thing. Okay, maybe he just doesn't like people clearing their throats. Maybe that's it, yeah. So anyways, Leonardo says the iconic phrase, it's time to go back, which we've got to write it down because we've got to go back in time. It's time to go back. We've got and, to go back. It's like lost. We've exactly. We've got to go back. I think they, that's a direct reference from Jack in season three where he says to Kate, we have to go back, Kate. He's, he's referencing Turtles. He's referencing, oh, wow, okay. So now, this is before the scene where they say to Elias Coteus, hey, you're claustrophobic. And he says in response, I never looked at another guy before. Okay, that's right. That's coming up. They go back to New York and they take him to their sewer house and he says he's claustrophobic and they make an incredibly off-color joke, homophobic as hell. And look, it was but, but, there's, but it doesn't even make sense because if he thinks they're saying you're homophobic and he yes. responds, hey, I've never even looked at another guy before. It, it's, that doesn't even make sense. It, it's uh, it, again, Scott, they weren't good at writing jokes, you know, and I think that's why you're brought in on this project. Okay. You know, they, I will that, say the burying the pizza was funny. I laughed at that. That scene, I, when I saw it, when I watched it, I was like, I actually think Scott's going to laugh at that part. <laughs> okay, because, I did. Because I'll be honest, as a kid, I don't think I understood the penicillin thing. I was like, what the hell is a penicillin? So is that a topping on, on pizza? It's not. That that part of it isn't all that well executed. But when, when they bury the pizza because it's too <laughs> old to eat, I thought that. And they do a da 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 and they have like a funeral for it. I thought that was funny. So we're going to be doing some Easter eggs on that with April O'Neil's funeral. In, right. in, in right. our movie. Huh? Yes. Oh, in, oh, that's in, right. In our movie with, with April forgot. O'Neil's funeral, that's how it starts. You gotta write this stuff. This is why I always write. So stuff they put down. penicillin on her. They 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 instead of sprinkling dirt on the casket, it's a little bit of penicillin. Wow. So we're in Act Three. We've back to New York, and what happens as soon as they get back to New York is they're attacked by the foot, and then they fight till the end of the movie. Right. That's so basically the foot. By the way, now I'm realizing is a parody of the hand, which yes. is which yes. are the ninjas yes. in Daredevil. Okay, that's right, Scott. He's catching up. Look, Scott, you're gonna be a freaking master of the turtles by the okay. end of this. Okay, great. So, so we get so they they finally it's revealed that uh, Shredder is this they, they have a flashback to uh, right. Splinter's uh, how he came to New York you find out that Shredder is the guy that that Splinter scarred yes. with his claws uh, back in Shredder uh, killed Splinter's master right and. All you know, stuff that should have been pushed earlier, but I'm happy to have it here because it, okay, it did yes. make for a it's gripping a, finale. It's a late flashback where you're like, oh, shit, this is personal, you know? Yeah. And uh, what happens is Casey Jones and this little kid, Danny, rescue Splinter. Yeah. And while April O'Neil, by the way, not part of it. Uh, no. I guess it's not woman's work or something, but I, I do have to say at least she wasn't made a hostage the whole time. No, she wasn't a but... hostage. There's a scene where she's like in a crawl space above them and they're fighting and she knocks someone with like a with like a broomstick. Right. I and forgot. Then... Yeah, that's the one thing she gets to do. And then Michelangelo's like, good job, April, or something. It's pretty That cool. felt like a reshoot to me of like, oh man, April just yeah. out and out disappears from this yeah. movie. We got to put I, her I think that's somewhere. where I sing her in the first act and we're, we're going with her daughter who's been training with the turtle their whole life you know oh, wow. so, so okay. we don't have to deal with that in our movie but so anyways this this third act is a sort of flurry of action where they're just fighting the foot trying to find splinter because they know that the shredder has splinter at a certain point so they're on the roof they're on a roof this is the final scene of the movie they're on a roof and they're fighting the foot and they beat them all up and then who drops down from the ceiling with a chunk? shredder that's shredder that's right he's there he's got to battle him and um, they all take turns for some reason because what do you think, think of this fight scene, Scott? Because this is where you get to see the like most sort of like suit combat. Yeah, there's not a lot of combat in the movie. There's like approximately 15 seconds here and there. <laughs> yeah, a couple like well, the, a couple of those punches where you just sort of like put your fist up behind you and you like knock someone over. You know, right? Yeah, there's not a lot. So, so it was good to see a little more combat in this. But I, yeah. I wish. I wish they weren't doing that stupid thing of like, let's take them on one at a time, like all four attack, which, you know, by the way, Jack, speaking of Jackie Chan, mm -hmm. I was watching a documentary about him and he talked about how he hated that in movies and how he always wanted in his movies everyone to attack at the same time. Oh, it made his movies so incredible, like Rumble in the Bronx. He's like fighting like seven people in once with that like yes. refrigerator scene. And it's like that. That's what makes those movies great. 
But for yeah. turtles, we go one at a time. <laughs> sure. And we, we, we shoot for it to see who's going next if we don't want to, you know. <laughs> yes. But, but this scene is like, I think for kids would be kind of scary because Shredder's like ready to kill them, quite honestly. Yeah, he's going to kill them. He doesn't have a great plan because when finally Splinter is hanging on to him and he's hanging on for dear life before he falls to his death, he decides to take out uh, a weapon and tries to kill Splinter at that point, which is like, you're going to get dropped. Either way you slice it, let him pull you up and then kill him. It's a really stupid, like Shredder kind of gets really stupid at the end. But again, once he realizes it's personal, he starts slipping. This time it's personal, yeah. And, And then I have to say he finally drops down and i think he's not dead and elias coteus kills him by mashing him up in a garbage truck so this was a controversial point of the movie shredder falls from the top of this thing splinter has now defeated shredder which would and... be fine if he fell to his death because it was his fault he tried right, to attack right, splinter right. he was trying to but instead <laughs> they give Eli- they give casey jones this sort of moment where he looks away from camera and says oops Turns on the the trash compactor and crushes Splinter to death. To death. Or or Shredder. And it's truly shocking. You're a super fan of this movie and you can't keep Splinter and Shredder. It's hard. (laughs) They both end in er. Like er and start with It's hard. But but he kills Shredder in a way that to me was like, as a kid, I always thought, Okay, oops, he crushed him. I, I never really thought about it. But then as an adult, I was like, wait, what just happened? This guy just committed a murder here. Yeah, and then all the cops was. show up. It's like, April, you've got to report that this guy committed a murder. <laughs> yeah, it's bizarre because <laughs> so many movies bend over backward to make the hero blameless in a villain's death. Of like, oh, well, you know, he was going to save his life. But at the last second, the villain tried to shoot him and all that kind of stuff. And this one just like straight up has Elias Coteus crushing a man to death. And they did the work to get everyone off the hook. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like, it's they, nuts. It's nuts. But you know what? That's what makes this movie gold, Scott. It's dark as hell. Shredder's <laughs> it's dark dead. As hell. Um, Shredder's dead. That's and- what I said. <laughs> I love to write that down. Shredder's dead. That's what I said. Yeah, let's get um, uh, let's get uh, Curtis Mayfield in on this. So I, th- that's sort of the end of the movie, Scott. You get a weird. Kiss well, you do with have April uh, and Sam- Casey Jones. I yeah, terrible that. kiss. You have Sam Rockwell. This is the only time I I clocked that it actually was Sam Rockwell. Mm. Was when he has the one line. Uh, I forget exactly what. I'll it tell says. you what it is. He has a few lines in the movie. First one is bad timing, and that's when they rob April O'Neil in the Ro- first. Okay, scene. I didn't know that was him at that point. That was him. Then the second one is when they're walking through the like sort of like like little uh like runaway home for these boys there's like video games and shit they could do whatever they want which is why by the way i thought most kids like the movie was the fantasy element of like all these oliver twist style pickpockets hanging out together playing video games all it's day. a huge part of it scott <laughs> we haven't they, even touched on it they have a, they have a big part like that in double dragon the movie as well i think it was oh. just a trope at the time it was just like okay. we own this warehouse it's for kids you know it's like burger king kids club Sure, of course. Burger King, by the way, represented in the movie. Yes, definite first. A lot of product placement. The Burger King comes out before Domino's even in the movie. It's very yeah, interesting. Yeah. Um, but anyways, the second line he says, um, he's like, you can do whatever you want here, some shit like that. And then somebody's like, do you have cigarettes? And he goes, you want regular? A menthol. That's that was him a, saying that? That oh, okay. was him. And it's a weird part because it's like. Because what kid smokes menthol? Yeah, why are we bringing up cigarettes at all? And then menthol? What are you talking about? That's an old people thing. And then the final line is when the uh, – this is an Easter egg, Scott. Final line, uh, the police chief is saying, uh, what happened here? We want some answers. And then he says, you'll get some answers. Or no, he doesn't say that. He says, why don't you check out the Eastman Warehouse on Laird Island? You'll get uh, your answers there. A little uh, – east. Uh, that's for the comic book creators. For the writers, right. Kevin Eastman Wait, what and answers Peter are – they're supposed to go to some island? No, he's like – I missed this. The, so the the warehouse is like on an island. I think it's like supposed to be like Staten Island or something. Oh, okay. They do. You do see Elias Coteus like kind of w- when the one kid goes back, leaves the the turtles yeah, to go back I, to the to to rescue Splinter. You do see. Yeah, it's on. Yeah, it's like in, it's like on an island. So he's the the guy's like, "What happened here?" Because the the police chief didn't know anything about the foot or Shredder, and he says, "If you want your answers, go to Eastman Warehouse on Laird Island." Got and it. my whole life, I was like, I don't know what the fuck he's saying there. Those places don't exist. And it wasn't until just today when I watched the movie <laughs> when you over figured here, it so, out, Whoa. where I was like, oh shit, that's a sick little Easter egg, Sam that's Rockwell. Well, two lines that I couldn't figure out, and I had to to go back. You saw me go back trying to figure yes. out what they were. Was at one point, Elias Coteus uh, appears to say, 
I'll never call a golf a doll a game again. Which, okay, here's what he says. <laughs> <laughs> so this is the scene, the golf club scene, Scott. Yeah. Where he gets knocked, he's getting beat up by Shredder's assistant, and... Well, and he's, he's, uh, what he says, I saw the subtitle, is, yes. I'll never call golf a dull game again. But instead he pronounces it, I'll never call a golf a dull a game again. <laughs> Look, by the time they're at this part of the movie, they're not, like, doing multiple takes. They're just like, we've, we've, we've spent, <laughs> we, like, we've, we're burning through we've daylight. We've spent months in these hot-ass suits, and, and now that we've got, like, no turtles in these scenes, we just got to get through them. We, we just got to get through them. The other one so, that I couldn't figure out is when they kiss, when April O'Neil and Casey Jones kiss... Uh, one of the turtles said something, and I had to rewind it three times. And I guess it's important because mm. it's referenced in one of the closing songs, but he says 9.95, which I guess is an Olympic scoring mm, joke mm, on how mm. good their kiss is. Nice. And then they're, then it's a big part of one of these closing rap songs. Yes, the closing rap song really does a good job of like explaining the movie. Like Honestly, you could have probably just listened to the song. <laughs> Yeah, well, which song? The one by Spunkadelic? The one by... Uh, Partners the, in Crime with a K-R-Y-M-E? Yeah, what was his? The Humpty Dance or whatever? Is that his song? Something like that, Is yeah. Is he the Humpty Spun Hump? Spunkadelic was one which I thought was a little inappropriate for a kid's movie. Look, this movie is rude, chewed, and has a, is crude as well. That's true, yeah. It's as rude as Raphael is cool <laughs> and rude. Scott, I wanted to just tell you a couple of facts about the movie just because I, I don't think you understand what went into it. April O'Neil, Judith Hogue, had no idea what Ninja Turtles 1 was. Ninja Turtles, she had no idea what it was when they hired okay. her. Okay. She was in my position. Yes, she was in your position. You want to know who was the Sprague to her? Okay, sure. Robin William Scott. What? They were on the set of a movie. They did a movie together. I got to look up what it is. And it's, it's pretty much canon that Robin Williams like, gave her all his Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle comics and like talked her through the entire franchise. What? Okay, if this is, this has to be around 1988 or so, I, which yeah, is when Good so. Morning Vietnam came out, but maybe no, she was No, it's, it's like a comedy. Uh, do you, you know, but like, um, isn't like that Jack crazy? Jack or something like a Jack? It wasn't Jack. Could you imagine Robin Williams explaining this movie to you? I would love that. I mean, uh, uh, that's really interesting. I can I can imagine it because yeah, he's such okay. a comic book fan. You yeah. Know? So he was like, "Oh, you got to do this movie. The mm -hmm. Ninja Turtles are this. The Ninja and April O'Neil's the coolest character." Mm -hmm. So you know, look if if you want to knock the movie, Scott, people like you know Jim Henson, Robin Williams, you know the ta the Robin Aha Williams guy. doesn't necessarily like the movie. I would love to see the follow up conversation with it, <laughs> where he's like, "Oh, I saw that movie, boy." Where he's oh, like, "This movie oh, sucks." Oh. Oh, and he does the like the meter. Oh, oh. oh, and it's like not going into. It's like oh, oh. on the that's low level. A, it's not a nine point nine five. Oh, that's a oh, oh. that's more like oh. a three. Mindy, Mindy. <laughs> um, one other fact I want to tell you about this, but when it was released in my country in Britain, I guess I'm British or something. I don't know. That's sure, yeah, I think you are. I think I was from Tampa, but we're changing the canon. I'm British now. Okay. Um, now when it came out there, they didn't include Ninja in the title. Scott, it was called Teenage Mutant Hero Turtles. Oh, I wonder because ninjas weren't as popular. I'll tell you, I think it was some racist shit. I think they oh. were like afraid. It was like that white was people wouldn't go see it. It oh, was a fear thing. And they also took out the scene where Michelangelo uses the nunchucks, you know, when they have the little yeah, nunchuck they off. they took that out? They took it out because apparently they're afraid of nunchucks. <laughs> like, oh. There was like a weird nunchuck ban or something at the time. And oh man, England always banning our our the weapons that Why we should be constitutionally that? allowed to use. Thank I'm a big you, two A guy. I don't know if is Same. that canon. Yeah, that's we're, we're all two A guys. What are we in the like? Uh, the, what's the party that they? Uh, I'm double A, thinking triple X. <laughs> Scott, I'm writing that down. Mm -hmm. Double. I don't know where we're going to use it, but I'm writing. Let's get it Peaches down. involved in this to do uh, the the Spunkadelic reboot. <laughs> okay, Scott. So we've watched this movie. We've sort of done a download on it, Scott. Yeah. And I think you understand the themes of fatherhood. Oh, by the way, the one thing about the movie that suddenly it 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 is literally the last line. I think. Yes. And I was like, oh, that's part of their thing. Yes. So I think the whole movie is the origin story for this line, by the way. They, they're they trying to come up with a, uh, an exclamation, a positive exclamation and a celebratory one that they can all say in order to celebrate their victory. And I'll say this. This is a joke that's set up from earlier because you see them pitching jokes to each other. And sometimes they're like, that's the one. That's the right one. Michelangelo gets one. Donatello gets one. Now we're at the end. They're pitching for the like celebratory moment. Right, Scott? Right. And then 
Splinter comes in and Splinter has always been sort of a hard case on them, you know, mm-hmm. and been like, hey, you know, this is not the way of the mm-hmm. ninjutsu. And he comes in and he says, I'm not even going to do his accent because I don't want to get canceled either. But he yeah. says, he says, I've always preferred or I've always taken a shine to. I can't recall exactly what he says. Mm-hmm. Cowabunga. And yeah. they all go, yeah, cowabunga. <laughs> and I went, oh, that's one of their things. Yes. And then the final line is, I made a funny. <laughs> is it? <laughs> I think he says I made a funny after that when okay. they're all laughing. And all right. to me, I'll take your that word for it. I was I maybe love. laughing too hard or, or, or perhaps even like just shocked with the revelation that we'd gone a whole movie without them saying cowabunga. Was that well, it? Well, I was watching. As soon as they said cowabunga, you stood up from the couch and started clapping like you were full standing <laughs> yes. ovation. So I think you might have talked over when they said, I made a I funny. I made a funny. Was mm-hmm. that from the cartoon, the cowabunga thing? I think the cowabunga is from the cartoon. Yes, not from the comics. Right. So, so when- again, another entry in my theory that this was made for people who knew the cartoon really well. And who are going to be like, oh, yeah, awesome. Which every comic book movie sort of has a little bit of that. you know. I do think it's a prototype Marvel type movie. Well, when you saw the original Batman or the 1989 Batman, rather, you know, it had a ton of these things where like the bat plane flies up right in front of the moon and it looks like the bat signal. And I remember opening night at uh, Universal City Walk when I saw it. um, Everyone just like, whoa, like, you know. (laughs) Because it's like the bat signal, you know, and so like a lot of these movies have that kind of stuff. Well, you got to think about it at the time, Scott, 1990, this was already the most popular cartoon series on on television. And then the the toys were were the most sold toys of 1990. They sold like... Which made these guys super rich. Super rich, which is all before the movie. So in a way, there was a lot of turtles in the air before this came out. Sure. And I look, I think they do a good job in this sort of shadowy, bad, badly filmed scenes of doing backstory with like little turtles that say radical. To me, you didn't, Scott, you tell me you didn't laugh when there was a little baby turtle going radical, radical, radical. Uh, I mean, it, uh, uh, <laughs> I lost my damn mind when I saw Well, the stuff. first, the first one goes pizza, pizza. And I thought, <laughs> I thought a little Caesars product Ooh, placement was interesting. happening. Little Caesar's trying to get in there with some line pitches. Yeah. I don't like, we, we only say pizza once in ours, because unless Little Caesar's is going to pay us, we're only going to say it once. Yeah, exactly. Well, um, definitely not what I expected. Mm. I, I, I was sort of uh, hoping that number two will be a little more professionally made, and I don't know anything about number two at all. I don't know about this Oprah thing. When it came up, it might have been to promote the first one. It might have been to promote number two. Well, maybe they all we should came out in up. like sec- they were like all between 1990-1993. So it all was happening at the same time. I doubt the turtles would have gotten on Oprah without the first one being popular. So I kind of feel like for, I feel for like the it next was two, one, especially because one was sort of like a little too gritty. Like play- yeah. playmates didn't even make toys for the first one because they thought it was too violent. Right. So for the next one, maybe we should try to watch that Oprah thing. Yes, let's watch that Oprah thing. And I'll say for the next one, a lot of people, this is their favorite one. I won't give you any spoilers. Oh. Um, but it's it's everyone's favorite one. It's a bit of a reaction to the first one. And I don't know. I am I love one, but I don't know, Scott. You might watch two and be like, okay, this was my turtles. Movie. Okay, well, should we is there is there a certain person? We don't have to say who it is, but mm-hmm. who who loves number two that we should invite to be along with us? Well, we'll, we'll figure it out. You know, I think there might be a person who who's a sort of Ninja Turtles aficionado that could walk you through why two was important. Okay, great. So, do you so know anything the, about two? Right? I don't now? know like, anything uh, other than I know because you said it. The title is apparently the secret of the ooze. The secret of the ooze. I don't know anything about. It. I don't know if if April O'Neil or Casey Jones appear in it. I don't know whether Corey Feldman continues his mm. uh, vocal role. I don't know anything about it. Now, I'm going to ask you one question, Scott. It's going to be a little vague, but maybe it jogs your memory. Okay. Do you know anything about the music from Ninja Turtles two? I do not know, Scott. We're in for a little bit of a treat. <laughs> oh, boy. Well, there was an MC Hammer song in this, and I was like, did he do the theme to this much like he did for Adam's Adam Family 2? No, uh, it was the I Humpty don't... guy. But, Scott, I, I, and one other thing, I, the music of this movie, the scoring of this movie, I, again, I will say is so good. I know you think it's some sloppy shit. The no, the scoring score... of the movie is amazing. And when they drop their little stings and shit, that shit is awesome. The, the score, they spent some money on the score, although it was the typical 80s thing of having a very militaristic score of like, <laughs> which then adds a blues guitar on it going, 
Meow. Anytime a cool character comes on. Yeah, they did a lot of that. Like, or when like Casey Jones hits Raphael and he's flying through the air, you hear like a like it's a mm-hmm. guitar riff to show how shitty something was. Right. But, yeah, Scott, they're going to carry over a lot of that scoring into. Don't two. tell me anything. Don't tell me. I'm not anything. telling you anything. I'm just anything. saying you're going to love it, Scott. I have a feeling once we watch two, we're going to be able to look at the script and say, hmm, all right, so we have our bare bones. How do we add the meat to this thing? Okay. All right. Well, I'm, uh, you know what? I don't like eating bones. I prefer eating meat. So <laughs> let's do it. All right. I'm excited. I'm excited. I I'm now excited know, too. I now know a little bit more about the turtles. If you had to ask me what I know about the turtles now, they say cowabunga. Mm-hmm. They do like pizza. Mm-hmm. They wear. They all have different color masks, which I guess is supposed to be a shortcut to their personality. Mm-hmm. And they have the rat guy, Splinter, is their master, who mm-hmm. I can't remember if he's alive at the end. I think he is. He's alive. He says, that's a funny. I made a funny. And and the their their guy Shredder is dead. Shredder's mm-hmm. dead. And then all I know is you mentioned on an earlier show something about Krang. So I <laughs> I know I know that's a thing. I'll and say, Scott, we may not get into Krang. <laughs> oh, okay. Oh wait, no. You know what? Maybe we'll get into Krang. I don't think it's in this canon of the live oh, action. Okay. But we'll get to Krang at a certain. We'll point, get to so. Krang at a certain point. Okay. Cool. So I was going to say Comedy Crank Crank could be another title Ooh, for this Comedy well. Crank. Let me write that down. Okay. Maybe, so, it's, but, comedy, maybe it's Comedy Crank Crank. We have to stop talking C- <laughs> CMNT <laughs> on CBB. It's All right. Well, title, I, but I, love I hope people enjoyed this. I Those are the things I know about the turtles now, but I'm expecting next episode for my mind to be blown. Scott, you're going to get your mind blown. There's going to be some new characters. You're going to be fully on board and maybe some returning characters like the okay. turtles. They Maybe come we'll back. Know. Yeah, we don't know. Okay, they do come back. Okay, <laughs> they do. They do. Spoiler. All right. Scott, well, this has thanks been so fun. much. Thank, this was so so much. so much fun. I'm glad we're finally being able to talk turtles. Scott, when I listen to Bang Bang next week, I don't want to hear any Ninja Turtle stuff. Okay, I'll try to stay away from it. Uh, if you if you steer into it, just make sure, like, okay, I'll talk about. It I'll just second. shut it down. I'll shut it down. And say, hey, that's another show. That's another. Th- thank you, Scott. That's all I want. Okay. Um, all right, Scott. Well, from Whisper Studios, uh, I want to say to our audience, thanks for listening. And um, we'll catch you next time on We Have to Stop Talking TMNT on CBB.